we are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts, Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Star Wars yet again proves that it is completely incapable of delivering a satisfying conclusion to a trilogy. This time, it is ruined by a failure to plan out the overall story before they started making the trilogy, endless fetch quests, trying to please everyone and thus pleasing no one, way too much fan service, and a reluctance to break new ground. I have a bad feeling about this. What in the name of our Lord and Savior of the franchise, Ryan Johnson, was JJ thinking making this? I realize this video is long. I'm not doing what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. Despite the length of this video, I will not go over every single reference this makes to other movies or other pieces of media, nor will I go in-depth about every single actor or everyone responsible for the technical aspects. People who have more experience on those have done videos that go into those quite well. I do not hate neither fans nor detractors of this, you know, of, of any of the Star Wars movies, and I do not think that you know, the fandoms of any of them are purely made up of people who hate those who disagree with them or have other values than them. If you express a viewpoint that goes against what I say in this video, the only thing I ask is that you keep it respectful and I will answer respect with respect myself. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or towards others, I'm most likely just going to ignore you. I don't hate any of these three trilogies. I do have issues. I have almost no issues with episodes four and five, but other than that, I do. Or eight. Okay, I do have some issues with episode eight, but they. My. For me, the positives of that movie greatly outweigh the negatives. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster for at least some of the video until my back feels better. And let's see. Right, so I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. And as soon as I end the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie and, again, the others, and I, in including discussing the ending of this movie and the others. And... Right, so, this movie is a soft reboot. I try to grade any soft reboot on a curve. The reason why is because I like not being miserable, which is what I will be if I focus on all the ways that it is inferior to the original. Is any soft reboot as good as the one or multiple movies that it is a soft reboot of? Almost definitely not. If that exists, then I don't know of it. It's a soft reboot, mainly because they figure that's a better way to ensure making a lot of money off it, but that doesn't mean that it's automatically bad, hence grading on a curve. I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. I do have some issues with J.J. Abrams, but again, I would have the same issue, you know, the things I'm going to criticize of this movie. I would be criticizing him, you know, if it were a filmmaker that I absolutely loved the work of. This movie did not ruin my life, my childhood, my day, any other amount of time, the franchise, genre, medium, or media in general. Not to me, at least. Now, I try to find a good balance between being critical and being appreciative when I watch a movie. I no longer go into something hoping not to like it or not hoping to like it. Those two are technically not quite the same thing. I'm getting all Lewis Carroll. I'm going to move on. I, I do both, or is another. I'm moving on. 
but I'm also not interested in apologism. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that or liking others doing that. I'm saying it's not really for me. In my opinion, it's all well and good to recognize what someone tried to do, but if you think they failed, then looking at how it failed and why is more likely to lead to success the next time than a condescending pat on the back. Now, my... Yeah, I, I personally don't mind when people who aren't big fans of Star Wars review them, comment on them, that sort of thing, but I know for some people it's very important, only fans do, that sort of thing. So, I'm going to start by underlining, I have criticisms of all the Star Wars movies, but I do... There's... All of them have something that I really do appreciate. And I have by now watched every single Star Wars movie. And I am going to briefly rank. So yeah, from... Let's see. Right. I'm going to start with my ratings. So episodes 4 and 5 are 10 out of 10 for me. Episode 6 is a 6. All three prequels are 5 out of 10. Episode 7 is a 7. Rogue One an 8. Episode 8 is a 10. Solo is a 7. And yeah, so, so ranking them worst to best. Episodes 2, 3, 1, 6. Solo, Episode 7. Rogue One, Episode 4, 5, and 8. And I will include this movie. I, I will give my rating for this movie and include it in the ranking at the end of the review itself. Sometimes my opinion, my, my ultimate opinion of it changes as I go through it verbally in my review. That's why. Now, my making jokes on this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking, not, not every single thing I joke about is actually something I dislike. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and overanalyze everything I watch. Now, yeah, so there are several major appeals of this kind of film. One of them is they can have many wild concepts, have them play off each other. Like man an example would be magic power versus robots. Outside of this kind of thing, you will only have a few at a time. And yeah, this one does, and it is quite fun. And they're wild concepts. They can also give compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency. And more casual stuff. And yes, I would say this this does. There are some like family relationships and and sort of interpersonal conflict between family members and found family as well as blood relatives. Now some of the characters on the same team and or side do combo attacks. There are some compelling interpersonal conflicts between them. And Right, so content warning and or trigger warning. Torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting, mental illness, xenophobia, murder, body horror, genocide, bullying and other abuse, and space fascists. Now this movie is rated PG-13 and so is this video. Now, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from this movie, in another tab. I won't mind. I'll know, but I mean, I won't even know, of course. I'm not spying on you right now. We're not part of a forced dyad. I... Can you see my environment? I can. I can only see you. Right, of course you can. Cause, cause camera, I put the camera on me. That explains that. Now I streamed this movie and thus didn't pay anything extra to watch it. 
So anything negative I say in this video, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. I'm not upset at how it compares to other Star Wars movies, what I was expecting, trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative links I say in this are for criticism based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So, yeah, in a lot of ways, this is this has a lot of similarities with The Force Awakens. So I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another. So I'm not just repeating myself. And not exactly a surprise, but you do really need to have watched all of the Star Wars movies in order to fully, like, if you've only watched... I mean, I, I suppose there's probably not very many people who've only watched the sequel trilogy. But hypothetically, if you only watched the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy, there are some things in this movie that you won't fully appreciate. And that brings us... Right. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. And so, yeah, this is my very first viewing of this movie. I know, very late to the party on that one. And I watched, like, you know, I, I watched the entire movie, then had lunch, and now I'm recording. So very little time has passed, so it's very fresh in my memory. And, yeah, so, that brings us to the plot. So, this is set, I'm not 100% certain exactly how long, but some time. I, I feel like I've heard some say that there are a couple of years between the events of The Last Jedi and this one. Rey has had some training, satisfying those who said that she shouldn't be able to do Force stuff and Jedi stuff without any training whatsoever. I stand by that what she did isn't outlandish compared to what other Star Wars protagonists have done with little to no training. But I'll move on from that. The Emperor is back. Because JJ thought that was the that that somehow that was a good idea, and yeah, he has a completely new. You know, he yeah, he has a fleet, he has a military force, and the, you know, our heroes will have to work especially hard in order to stop him. Meanwhile, Kylo is aware that the Emperor is back, and I don't think I'm going to give away exactly whether, you know, exactly how he feels about that, whether he works with him or not. And... Let's see, brings us to... And, right, the, this fares pretty well on diversity, other than obviously, you know, we still have a white woman in Ray, a black man in Finn. I forget, is, I guess Oscar Isaac, I guess he's, is he Latino or is he... Semitic. I, f I forget. I don't remember exactly, but, you know, there's some there. There are background characters that aren't just white dudes. And, yeah. Said it before, it bears repeating. Some people don't like that there is more diversity that are... See, I'm not sure. Is there technically more diversity? In this than in the prequels in, in the sequels than in the prequels I'm not sure I would say that but the 
the the they tend to have more prominence in the plot and be allowed to be more complex characters rather than just defined by you know before the yeah before the sequel trilogy the the women in Star Wars you know some sometimes they could be very tough i i have very little negative to say about leia but occasionally it would be just oh they're you know they're an attractive young woman and they're you know like padme by i i think they did a good job making her more sort of she was she was in control of herself in episodes one and two but then in episode three you know we get this very stereotypical these negative stereotypes of what women are like so she's overly emotional the only thing she focuses on is or not the only thing but she she focuses extremely much on the man in her life you know there's no the movie doesn't seem to think that women can handle trauma and grow from it which when you look at reality is just an absurd idea but that is something that people used to think and yeah and you know in the sequels in the sequel trilogy you know ray isn't just a woman you know she's allowed to do things that you know i'm i'm not saying she is the very first person who can wield the force uh, wield a lightsaber but she's the first one that we've really focused on. You know, I I wish I could say otherwise, but I don't even know the name of the blue oh, in the live action movies. I am aware that there is a there there are eh, there is at least one. Ahsoka Katana, I wanna say her name is. I haven't watched I haven't watched any of the the or I'm I am watching The Mandalorian. But other than that, I haven't watched the Star Wars shows. So I am, but I am aware that Clone Wars, I want to say it is, that there that has a prominent character who is a female Jedi. That's great. I just, a lot of people, I, I forget exactly who it is who's said this, but I'm inclined to agree with them. Most people are only ever going to watch the Star Wars movies. And before Rey, we did not have a major character that you knew a lot about. Like, the, I, I barely know anything about the blue-skinned female Jedi in the prequels. You know, I remember that we do see her die. We don't see every single Jedi die. We see the ones on the Council die. But, you know, some, some of them we don't see die in episode 3. She is one of the ones we see die, so she's given that much respect at least. And she has blue skin. I'm sure she has a name. I'm not sure you would know that name unless you, like, look into, like, if you do your research. But if you just watch the movies, I, does she even have a line? Thinking more about it i think there might be a few female jedi in the, the climax of attack of the clones the the geonosis arena but again i don't know their names i don't know anything about them other than that they are jedi and happen to be female you know if you don't pay close attention you might not even realize that there are any women there it's just a a blur of of lightsabers you know I don't think anybody's unaware that Ray is female. And right. So that brings us to the writing which Oh, is that All oh, right, right. Yes. The writing this was the the screenplay and story was written by Chris Terrio, who also wrote both versions of the Justice League, both the theatrical and Zack Snyder's. 
though I, I feel like I read somewhere that he they, they didn't use that much of his stuff for once Joss Whedon came in and started doing scene directing writing and directing scenes they did not use very much of Chris Terry's material for Justice League but there's bad writing in the Snyder Cut too some would say more I'm one of them he also wrote Batman v Superman holy crap he wrote Argo which is a great movie uh, absolutely and Heights which I know basically nothing about and J.J. Abrams wrote the screenplay and story and yeah other than this movie he wrote The Force Awakens Super 8 and Regarding Henry, which I haven't watched, Lost, which, boy, did he, he could have done a much better job on that one, and he abandoned the show before, so that, before it ended, and that, I think there's a chance his ending would have been better. He wrote the third Mission Impossible movie, which is a fairly good, like, they, that really did rejuvenate that series you know the the only movie that really did significant damage to it th that brand was the second movie and there's there's six years between the second and third movie which is the longest amount of time between you know and and now it's doing really well you know everybody we all loved the i want to say sixth one was the most recent they're filming the seventh one now it sounds amazing you know i've, I've isn't that the one where they apparently like went to space to film at least once? That's that's awesome. He also wrote Alias, which, other than the final season, is a really strong show. Joyride, which I remember liking. It's it's not like it's not Shakespeare, but for what it is, he wrote Armageddon, which is one of the worst movies I've ever seen, at least big budget ones. Gone Fishing, which is terrible I, I I'm not sure I have anything to say about the movie that film brain didn't his review is great forever young which is fine for what it is oh right and he wrote taking care of business which I also have not watched and the story of this movie was also written by Derek Connor wait was that and Colin Trevorrow but I think they ditched I'm pretty sure they ditched Colin Trevorrow's. I'm, I forget if they used Derek Connolly's. Anyway, he, if, yeah, I haven't watched any of these movies, but he wrote three Jurassic World movies. Oh, right, and the most recent one hasn't come out yet. It's coming out sometime this year. I don't think it's come out. I, I haven't heard. I, I haven't. I've watched the first movie. It's, you know. It's a good movie, but it wasn't a movie where I was like, man, I gotta watch more of that. I'm, I'm not sure, what, what are they gonna do that they didn't in the first one, you know. Pokemon Detective Pikachu, which I've heard some refer to as the only good video game movie, and if I knew anything about Pokemon, maybe I'd watch it at some point. I do like Ryan Reynolds. He wrote Kong Skull Island, Monster Trucks. If you're not getting to it. So yeah, he's he's well worse. Blah, well versed. He is well worse. He's well versed in this kind of fantastical stuff, you know. And there are definitely some fantastical elements in the story, right? Yeah, Colin Trevorrow also, and he wrote. He also wrote those three Jurassic World movies. And making revolution, yeah, yeah. Colin Trevorrow was going to write and direct this movie, and then the book of Henry came out, and boy, did that make people change their minds about, you know, wow, Colin Trevorrow. Look at the kind of stuff he's. Oh, wow, that was that was not a good movie, and. I have not watched that movie, but I don't think I need to. I do recommend Folding Ideas video on it. He really takes it up. Like, he, he did a very thorough... Ah, what's the word? A very thorough autopsy of, of that.
now we yet again have an you know just countless coincidences in the script for things to work out you know for for the story to run more more smoothly you know and yeah it's it's a big problem in all of three sequels i would say this is the worst this is the one that has the most of them so episode 8 ignores a lot of what episode 7 sets up and then episode 9 ignores a lot of what episode 8 does and you know, I, I get they were definitely trying to, like, they were trying to, they were trying to throw the, the fans of Episode 7 and, and the people who loved the original trilogy and hated Episode 8. They were trying to throw them a bone. And I do appreciate, you know, if, if, if millions of people around the world don't watch a Star Wars movie, does it make a sound so... I get that, but I, I do think that, you know, good good intentions, but it's kind of, it's a little bit too late. You kind of already did, like, I mean, ultimately, episode 8 goes in a different direction than a bunch of stuff in episode 7, but it doesn't, like, completely just, yeah. Episode 9 really does, like, Episode 9 rewrites parts of Episode 8 that, some, you know, some of the most controversial decisions in Episode 8 are just rewritten. It just pretends, like, we watched the movie, you know, I'm not sure, did, did very many people watch this movie who didn't watch Episode 8? I mean, if they did, they must have been confused about at least some things, so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's the... Yeah, I will just very briefly, I have a bit of a headache. And it's been six hours since I last took some pain pills for it. So that was what just happened here. Now, the IMDb fact has answers to some of the major questions I don't necessarily agree with everything written there, but I don't really have anything concrete in place of it. So, yeah, for, for a bunch of it, I'm just going to direct you to that. I have heard that originally J.J. wanted Coruscant to be destroyed in Episode 7. Now, I understand why this idea is upsetting to a number of fans, which obviously doesn't make their harassment of J.J. at all acceptable. Personally, I... I think it would have been far more compelling if the planet destroyed was one that we had an emotional attachment to, and it would have made a lot of sense for it to be Coruscant, since the prequel said that was the seat of democracy until the end of the prequels. It would make sense for it to become it again after the original trilogy. So that was one JJ idea I agree with. I do understand why Disney balked. Now, right, so... Yes, IMDb Trivia notes that Colin Trevorrow was announced as the director in August 2015, with Derek Connolly and Jack Thorne writing the script, but Trevorrow stepped down before production began. J.J. Abrams was announced as the new director in September 2017, with Abrams and Chris Terrier writing the script. A significant amount of fans perceived that Trevorrow's unmade script draft, titled Duel of the Fates, would have been a better movie, and that Abrams ruined the script and the movie by changing the script to diminish the roles of all characters played by people of color. John Boyega stand, stand, stated the Duel of the Fates treated his character Finn better in an interview. So, I'm going to quote a bunch of fellow critics here. This has everything J.J. does badly on full display. It is the picture of Dorian Gray of him. It's a game of Star Wars Mad Libs for both sequels by Ryan Johnson, yeah, by Ryan Johnson for episode 8 and J.J. for episode 9. It's like fan fiction. So I, I wouldn't quite say that about episode 8, but for sure, this, yeah. Yeah, there are coincidences in all three sequels of, yeah, Star Wars sequels, but this one is at, it is at its worst. 
The story in The Rise of Skywalker is not existing, it's just chaos. People running around doing stuff in a pace which seems to be an attempt to hide an incredibly high amount of plot holes and inconsistencies. Even the ideas which could have been awesome fall flat due to the lack of an overall structure in the story and what seems to be a fear of surprising fans. If you just want a movie with stunning visuals, a high amount of fan service, and where everything happens as you predicted, then The Rise of Skywalker may be a good Star Wars movie. I like the music and the visuals, but the lack of good storytelling and respect for all the pre previous movies made me sad. And... Let's, yeah, this person gave it a 3 out of 10. Convoluted nonsense plot that feels like it was written by a 12-year-old. When did Star Wars become Michael Bay's Transformers? I know it's pretty much impossible to consistently follow up. Yeah, he calls Last Jedi a train wreck. But is this really the best they could come up with? This also might be the most inconsistent trilogy I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen a lot of movies. They didn't have a plan from the start, and it's super obvious just from watching these movies. J.J. Abrams wrote The Force Awakens with no intention of finishing it, then Ryan Johnson comes with The Last Jedi. And... See. Yeah, ignoring J.J.'s setup. Now with The Rise of Skywalker, we have J.J. clapping back at Ryan making most of Last Jedi pointless. Movies in this trilogy constantly retconning each other. It's beyond just a mess. Calling it a mess is a massive, massive understatement. It's like J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson rap battling each other, except in movie-making form. And a huge brand loved by millions is no time for an immature rap battle. Again, I, I don't... I have very few problems with episode 8. I, I agree with most of the decisions made on that movie. And I do want to say, this movie did not ruin episode 8 for me. I'm probably, you know, I'm the next time I watch episode 8 is going to be much sooner than the next time I watch this movie or episode 7, and certainly the prequels, but... Yeah, this I I don't know I I that doesn't really happen that much for me I you know I don't think there's the closest we have to a good sequel to a Halloween movie is Halloween 2018 and the other sequel I some of the other sequels I hate with a passion but they don't ruin the first movie for me I can sit down and watch Halloween 1978 almost any time now. It, back to critics, it beyond, fellow critics, it beyond boggles my mind how a billion dollar franchise can be handled so poorly by one of the richest companies on earth with almost unlimited resources. How are J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson such awful writers? How are they paid millions to do this? They should stick to only directing and stay far away from writing. I swear I've seen way better and consistent writing from regular community college students. And... It's like a cringeworthy email spat between two directors, each trying to cancel out the other's points, yet pretending to be civil. Ryan Johnson at least had the balls to try to have a vision, but failed. Yeah, he says he failed execution. And now Abrams, if you remember at all from Lost, is not a trustworthy storyteller. He hoodwinked all of us into believing his increasingly tangled web of plots and subplots was going to be somehow resolved in a brilliant ending that would cement his place as one of the truly great cultures of our time. Of course, now we know better. This is not a storyteller who is faithful to the narrative. He's a music video director, creating tantalizing plot points, only to dismiss them with silly or lazy answers. Miserable, incoherent, messy movie. Now. Because there are so many things that do not have consequences, it means there is no longer any excitement in, no, any tension in the movie. And so, plot twists. Plot twists in this movie are frequently handled quite badly. They basically, like, J.J. wants to keep surprising us. That's basic. that's his thing, you know? 
I've seen worse writing. I think some of his writing is great. And sometimes the thing that's surprising us over and over works. I think it largely works on Alias. You know, I'm, I'm not going to claim, like, it's, there are holes along the way. And, you know, if you, if you pay very close attention, you will discover, you know, some of the, like, retcons kind of screw with, you know, they, they kind of, yeah, they, they kind of ruin other aspects, you know, and it is, it's not always the best choice that, for, for that show, that, they focus so much on these plot twists. But this movie, like, there are definitely too many of the plot twists. And I guess, I mean, I'm not sure I would say that many of them were easy to figure out for the viewer. But that's, like, some of them, that just, they come out of nowhere. There's such non-sequiturs that just... And, and... Yeah, a bunch of them are just there. Like, I think the idea was to hope that people would be too distracted to notice that, yeah, the, the plot is kind of incoherent. Like, when, like when, when you really think about the overall, if you just break it down into plot points, it seems like there's not that much complexity to it. But at the same time, like, because so much of it relies on these plot twists, you know, these, like, the movie will have something that completely changes what we thought was going to happen. The, the, which, again, that's something J.J. Abrams loves doing. You know, we, we think a thing is going, going to go one way, it goes another way, and... I want to sort of make sure to note, as I forgot to before, when I took the pain pills, so I make sure there are a full six hours before I take the next two. So, the, yeah, he, he loves these plot twists that just completely upend things and you can only do that so many times before, like, it's, it's a, it's kind of exhausting to watch. And, yeah, it's just, like, if, if you just, once you've watched the entire thing and you know everything that happens, if you just, like, write on a piece of paper the important things that happen, yeah, it's, it's kind of a mess. And it, it seems like it should be easy enough to follow because it is, like, once you know everything, it's fairly linear. It's not... It's not dynamic. It feels dynamic while you're watching it, but, yeah. Moving on to the direction. And the things I've watched JJ direct, other than this, are The Force Awakens and Mission Impossible 3. I have not watched either of his... Stars Trek, Star Treks, Star Treks, or the movie Super Eight, and I think I forgot to copy in. Yeah, he did. He directed some Lost and Alias, and once again watched every episode of both of those shows. I probably, I'm not sure I'll ever watch his Star Trek movies. You know, I, I, I like. TOS and TNG. I love a lot of Voyager. I love all of DS9. I hate Enterprise with a passion. The show, not the ship, not any of the ships. I'm not sure I'm ever going to watch New Trek, honestly. It just... Too many things I've heard about it seem just complete out of way. Not the new ideas, not the fact that they go in some different directions. I'm not, I'm not going to get too much into it here. Anyway, so yeah, J.J. Abrams is usually brought in to bring new life to a franchise that's in trouble. This is the first time that he has made a movie that is meant to serve as the conclusion to its particular ongoing story. And if there is a God, it will also be the last. 
So, quoting fellow critics, they introduce so many new creatures here and don't develop them and throw aside old ones to make room for the new ones. There's more to Star Wars than puppets. It's important, but it's not the whole thing. J.J. Abrams has written at least a half dozen movies and TV shows that have bad endings. His mystery box leads to bad endings. There are a lot of good things here, but they are handled too quickly. No time to build up and do it organically. It's like microwaving instead of slow cooking. And, yeah. Some say that this is the worst of the nine episode Star Wars movies. Some say it's the worst of all 11 live-action Star Wars movies. Yes, I am aware of the Clone Wars. I'm pretty sure I did watch the Clone Wars. It acts as sort of a pilot for the show, the Clone Wars movie. I watched it. I don't remember very much. I, I'm i almost definitely going to watch the show eventually. I'm not putting it off because I don't like the idea of the show. I do like the idea of the show. Now, back to critics. It's clear that the movie let's see, is partially made the way it is to make as much money as possible, and it is very, it, it hurts the creativity. Parts of the movie are meaningless. Something will happen not long after something happens, which means it might as well not have happened. The status quo is easily reestablished, and there's one part where 40 minutes you know, 40 minutes of the movie are devoted to this thing that is then just undone. It's just, yeah. The elephant in the room here is that they accidentally made a real movie last time. So, of course, J.J. Abrams was brought back on board to make sure nothing like that ever happens again. An intense and extremely emotional experience that falls apart when analyzed. It's not a disaster, but it works better emotionally than rationally. And they give it a 3.5 out of 5. It ends just as predictably as it began. A trilogy of Star Wars movies built on George Lucas's greatest hits. And they give it a 1.5 out of 4. When we meet up with brash pilot Poe, He's light speed, light speed skipping his way out of trouble. And Abrams is in much the same mode, whisking you from one thing to the next before you have much time to think or feel anything in response. And they gave it a 1 at 5. This is what happens when an artist lends his voice to the pre-approved sanitized discourses of big corporations that, in order to not offend anyone, Fails on emotionally engaging anybody. They gave it a 2 out of 5. I find its lack of faith in its audience, in its predecessors, in itself disturbing. 2 out of 5. Like most long standing franchises, this installment is like Marmite. It's brown and it smells funny. You are either going to love it or hate it. Ah, oh, makes more sense given the context. And we loved it. Fair enough. Four out of five. Now, the movie brings back things that it seemed like they were gone for good when episode, you know, by the end of episode eight. And they're brought back because they were popular, not because it makes any sense, not because they have a good explanation, and not because it makes this movie better by bringing it back. Just because a bunch of people, you know, were upset that these things were no longer in the movies. And again, I understand that, but this is not the way to handle it. Now, one critic said, Episode 8 made me feel like the director thought I was childish for still loving Star Wars as an adult. This movie felt like the director said it was a good thing, still loving Star Wars as an adult. Again, I, I do love, not all of Star Wars, but a lot. Like, I suppose, other than, you know, I already mentioned Episodes 4, 5, and 8. And the, yeah the three games, four games, up, 
at some point I need to learn how to count. I, I'm working on it. The four games up there, and I, I know you can't tell from the cover, at least not at this distance, but the uh, Dark Forces 2, the Jedi Knight, does, you know, my, my copy of it does include Mysteries of the Sith. So, yeah. Okay, I don't love Mysteries of the Sith. It, it did interesting things. I'll grant that. There's a level that kind of feels like it's out of an RPG. And considering that other than that, it's like it's a shooter game with force powers and a light and lightsabers. So, but that, yeah, it does some interesting things. But yeah, those are games that I really love. I could sit down and play them, you know, and have a lot of fun. I could sit down and watch episodes 4, 5, and 8 and have a lot of fun. So there is some Star Wars I love. I really didn't feel like episode eight was saying that it was wrong to I, you know, one hundred percent. It was it was trying to. It wanted us to. It it was trying to to change how we thought about some of the things. I just really don't agree with those who say that it wanted us to hate other Star Wars. Just challenge it, and you know. I'm not saying that it's overall quite as good as Episode 5, though, personally, you know, overall, I love it at least a little more than Episode 5. I do still love Episode 5. It's still the second best. It used to be the very best. But sometimes people forget Episode 5, we love it today, but at the time, a lot of people were shocked. Like, they did not expect, you know... Darth Vader's redeemable? Okay, there's only a hint that he's redeemable in that movie. It's more, it's a bigger part, much bigger part of it, episode 6. Anyway, Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. Obi-Wan lied when he said that, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that Luke's father was killed by Darth Vader. You know, Yoda confronts Luke about his personal flaws, you know, too brash, too impatient. He doesn't focus on the moment. You know, there are several times where he does the opposite of what Yoda says, or he'll he'll fail to do something Yoda instructs him to do. And, and Yoda says, you know, like, you know, Luke says, I don't believe it. And Yoda responds, that is why you fail. You know, Yoda specifically tells him, you know, don't bring your weapons into the, the, I guess it's a cave, anyway, that's strong with the dark side, you know, and he specifically, like, he specifically brings them in there, and that's part of why, you know, he sees himself as Darth Vader. He, he manages to defeat Darth Vader, but he sees himself as Vader. These were very shocking revelations at the time compared to episode four. And today we love it. I, I, I'm not saying, I, I would definitely say there are more flaws in the, in the screenplay in, of episode eight than episode five. Episode five, I'm not sure I can really point, like one of the, one of the things people point to is, ultimately, Han and Leia, like, they get to flirt, and it's, it's, a, it's entertaining watching them trying to get away from the Empire. But at the end of the movie, like, at the start of the movie, the Empire tries to catch them. At the end of the movie, they catch them. You know, it's, it's oh, okay, they catch Han. They technically, you know, Leia does get away, but... And, you know, the... the yeah, I. If if we didn't get anything out of it, if we didn't learn anything, you know, I, I would definitely say, for example, the the relationship between Leia and Han is strengthened over the course of that movie. Anyway, I think if it wasn't for you know decades of people loving the original trilogy, and the prequels not really challenging the the original trilogy much. There are a couple of things that really don't, you know, where it's like, well, but in the original trilogy, we're told this, now we're told that, you know, but if not for that, then 
uh, and, and episode 7 being so eager to please the fans, then I don't think people would have been as, you know, hypothetically, let's say episode 8 was, you know, as shocking as it is, but it came out, you know, let's say, let's see, Lucas would spend three years, episode 6 came out in 83, so it would have been 89. If it came out in 89, I think people would have, Maybe not at the time, but by now, been more receptive to it. Anyway, moving... Yeah, so back to fellow critics. Yeah, episode 8 hates episode 7. Episode 9 hates episode 8. People's... Uh, the, the way people rate Star Wars movies today is like the cave the Yoda warns Luke against in episode 5. The only thing in there is what you bring to it. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Boring, derivative, and redundant. Very true. And... Right, so... That... Yeah, despite how the movie destroys itself to deliver fan service for toxic fans, you can actually find a number of toxic fans who insist that there's no fan service in the movie for them at all. And they're furious. They think there should be fan service. I, I think very few movies are made better by fan service. I don't think it's always wrong to have fan service, but it doesn't tend to be what's good about the movie. It tends to be what some people love love most about the movie. But movies are movies are supposed to challenge us, you know. It's it's boring when a movie plays it safe. We we don't love a new hope because it's safe. We love it because it's so different from everything else at the time. Anyway, yeah, they're furious about there supposedly being no fan service in this movie at all. So you know, an argument could be made. They might as well not have put any fan service in this movie because that it wouldn't have pleased people anyway. It, it didn't, please. Anyway. So yeah, the opening of the movie, it opens in media res. I don't think that's a problem, but the whole movie is in too much of a hurry, and that's a problem. I personally think, you know, we've waited two whole years for another episode of Star Wars. Only one year for a Star Wars movie, but two years for a new episode and episode 8 ends in a very tantalizing manner. So, the... Yeah. I think it's fine to... I, I think it might even be a good idea to open in media res. But the fact that it's in that much of a hurry for the whole... And also the opening, it feels too much like it's pandering. And... Right, so I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. Let's see, it does basically fit with what came before. I think the ending... <sighs> yeah, I, I... Again, I take no pleasure in saying this, but the ending is pretty bad. Like, this is this is not a good ending. It's, it's a... It's very frustrating for a number of reasons, which I will get into in the spoiler sections. And... Yeah, so let's see. Is there technically Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing? Ultimately, yeah, maybe some convenient writing for sure. I'm not sure I would say there's real. Let's see, Deus Ex Machina. I mean, the, it, it's, it's more convenient writing, and a lot of the convenient writing is based on other Star Wars movie stuff. So, yeah. And yeah, so when when I when I'm very critical of an ending, I try to speak to do I think, you know, is it fair to to be, you know, some movies it's extremely difficult to to provide a good ending. I don't think this movie needed to like it, the movie shoots itself in the foot. By by the end of the movie, you can understand why that was the ending they 
ended up with. But it's still not very satisfying. It's still a very frustrating ending. And if they had just made some better decisions early on in making the movie, we're, we are talking when they wrote the script, I would definitely say they could have had a more satisfying ending to the movie, to the trilogy, to the overall story of all three trilogies. And I will say, I did this movie did not lose my interest at any point. And I was surprised by that because again, I, I don't hate episode seven, but it lost my interest about like I didn't I didn't stop watching. But I stopped caring as much as I originally did, about a third of the way through, because I felt like the action just had no consequences. And at the end of the day, like there was there was enough in here that kept me at least a little interested throughout the way. There, there was no point. And, and it's worth noting, I knew almost everything about this movie going in, because I've been hearing things about the movie, you know, I, I wasn't really trying to avoid spoilers. And, and a lot of the spoilers I heard years ago at, at a time when I did not think I would ever watch these three movies. So, yeah, when I when I did my research for this more recently in, in the, you know, months leading up to this, me, you know, me recording the video right now, I, I did take in a lot of spoilers that I hadn't heard before. And... I, I'm not sure. I think I would dislike the movie more if I didn't know these things going in because knowing them going in, I could kind of turn, you know, like me mentally go over, look at it from different angles and be like, I guess this is what they were going for. And that made me go easier on it. I completely understand people who hated this movie right after watching it, you know, going going into it, knowing nothing about it, hating it from, from some of the decisions they make. But, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, so the, the nostalgia bait definitely is excessive. The, the fan service and pandering, it just, I, I get it. I get why... Like, clearly, they were terrified. They, basically, what they... What they, they imagined in their heads after watching the, the, the reception, the fan reception especially. The, the critical reception to Episode 8 was largely good, but the fan reception, a lot of fans, you know, it, it split the fandom. There, there, were, there were people who loved the original trilogy, who kind of just accepted that certain things in the original trilogy were a certain way, and they really loved that episode 8 said, you know, now let's go in this other direction. And then you had the people who loved the original trilogy, many of whom, many of whom loved episode 7, expected episode 8 to be more of that, and they hated the changes. From, you know, they felt personally offended, they felt... They felt as though their childhood had been attacked. And I get being from, you know, obviously that's upsetting. I, th I don't think I'm going to talk more about that. But what I'm getting at is th the Disney executives looked at that and they were like, obviously we're making episode nine. There's no doubt about that. There are contracts, there are merchandising deals. We, we're making that, we are definitely making that movie. What if it bombs? What if we, you know, pump hundreds of millions of dollars into this thing and almost no one watches it? What then? That, like, you know, that, they were, they were really scared of that. Jay Exley, who's in general an excellent YouTuber, made a, a really compelling video talking about I, I, I want to say it's called The Bizarre Marketing of The Rise of Skywalker. And he points out all these, like, yeah, just these weird decisions when, when they were trying to advertise this. And I think part of 
some of these weird decisions is they were trying to make sure that as many people as possible would watch this movie. You know, one way or another, they would pique people's interest. And yeah, some of the decisions are baffling. It, the word bizarre is absolutely appropriate. A lot of people misuse, you know, bizarre, like words like Kafkaesque. And uh, yeah. Insulting to the intelligence. Think, you know, some, some of these terms are overused. Some people just throw them, you know, yeah. I get it. Kafka, brilliant writer, just really twisted stuff. You, you, you know, you want to reference him, obviously. I referenced him in something I almost definitely shouldn't have referenced him in some years back. But... He used the word bizarre 100% accurately and appropriately. Bizarre decisions, and I think they were driven by a just... I, I forget, it's possible JX makes that point himself in the video. But yeah, I, I think it was just they were panicking. They were terrified that they were going to lose millions on this movie. And it's, just, yeah, just completely s such strange decisions. Now, this is the part where I talk about if something in the movie subverts expectations. Ultimately, largely not. The movie really tries to be what it thinks fans of Episode 7 and of the original trilogy want. The use of superpowers is quite good. You know, force powers. And, yeah, there's especially, like, the the telekinesis and like acrobatics and such there's some really cool stuff there that brings us to the cast and characters so yeah daisy ridley as ray former scavenger from jakku member of the resistance and the next jedi master so you know, when I when I watched episode seven, I thought she's a little underdeveloped after a very strong introduction. Otherwise, fine as character. I had heard that a lot of people said she get, you know, she got a lot worse in episode eight and nine. I get why some people really hated, you know, the the stuff with her in episode eight. I personally liked mo liked slash loved most of it. This movie, I mean. It's just, it's too obvious and predictable and just, like, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing particularly interesting about it. It, I, I'm not gonna give away exactly what it is in, before the, I get to the spoiler section, but you're gonna, you're gonna see it coming, you know, even if I didn't tell you that it's obvious, you're gonna see it coming and it's just, it's, it's either going to be, you know, you're, you're either going to really like that you knew what was coming, which, again, all three of the original trilogy movies, the f when they came out, they really challenged preconceptions. They did not, did, they didn't give us what we wanted or what we thought we wanted. I, I'll grant that there was something, for, for sure, the fact that Han survives episode six, the fact that, you know, he and Leia end up happy together. You know, the, the, what's it called? The, the love triangle resolved in that way. A lot, a lot of people felt that Han was the more interesting character for Leia to end up with rather than Luke. And the two of them being brother and sister pretty well settles that, you know. So that, that was something that people wanted. And there, there were definitely some young viewers who really wanted the Ewoks. You know, you, like if if you just asked a, a small child, "Do you want walking, talking teddy bears?" Who, you know, I mean, there's there's dramatic scenes with them. There's scenes that are meant to be funny. I don't find them funny. Other people find them funny. 
that's great. There are like scenes that are supposed to be sad with them. There are scenes where they're cool, you know. So yeah, for if if you're in the demographic that loves that kind of thing, the Ewoks were very deliberately made to appeal to to you, you know. And and like. I think an argument could be made that the ending being so happy is also, you know, after episode five, it would have been like the, the um, a darker ending, a more ambiguous ending would have been much more what we expected, you know. But yeah, a lot of what the, the movie does is still, you know, was subversive at the time. And then, you know, the sequels are way too eager to please the... Yeah, anyway. J.J. Abrams is great at making sure that the the female leads in his stories, you know, they get to be heroic and, and cool badass, but they, you know, they maintain their femininity. Sydney Bristow is a spy, but she wants to be a teacher, like her mother. Unfortunately, sometimes he does make the the men in these stories very weak so that they don't overshadow the women you know Van, yeah, Vaughn in Alias being probably the the prime example I uh, I suppose it's possible there are some in the in the Star Trek movies but you know yeah Vaughn is who I especially think of as so, are there other examples in this movie? I mean, certainly some of the men take a bit of a backseat to, to Ray being a badass, for, for sure. Now, one critic said, you don't need a reason to see The Rise of Skywalker, but if you did, it would be Daisy Ridley. Her fierce commitment to playing Ray with integrity and intelligence and a total understanding of the kind of film she's in Lifts her every scene. Three out of five. And yeah, so Adam Driver portrays Kylo Ren, the supreme leader of the First Order. Son of Leia Organa and Han Solo, nephew of Luke Skywalker, grandson of Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader. And yeah, so it is not a spoiler to say that Kylo Ren's mask returns. The So, yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, the design of Kylo Ren's repaired mask is possibly based on Kintsugi, a centuries-old Japanese art to repair broken pottery by joining them together with a golden lacquer, giving the fractures a unique golden pattern. In Japanese culture, the Kintsugi technique also stands for highlighting imperfections and giving new life to a broken object which may be symbolic for the character. By repairing his mask, he attempts to revive his Kylo Ren persona despite the failures he had endured in his past. I don't particularly like that they did bring back the mask. I thought him smashing it was perfect, but I understand a lot of people wanted it back, and if you're going to bring it back, that is the right way. I, I appreciate that because it's it's true. It is very like you can see exactly where it was repaired. It doesn't look like he just, you know, had it, it didn't get like very seamlessly repaired. Now, in the original trilogy, Darth Vader hardly expresses any insecurity or uncertainty, but Kylo Ren expresses a lot. A lot of dictators are insecure, anxious. They're not good at what they do, and they know it. And, uh, you know, if if you look at, like, Hitler, for example, like, the one thing he really knew how to do and particularly cared about doing himself was give these angry speeches. And if people didn't get excited enough about it, he would storm off in a huff. And that was basically it. He was terrible at military strategy, which is good because if he hadn't been, if he hadn't put so much effort into winning, in, into defeating Stalin, into 
taking and keeping Stalingrad, there is some chance that he would have been a... Ultimately, he would have been stopped. There were enough other countries, but it could have taken a much longer time if he had focused on countries that he had a much greater chance of taking and keeping, which would have helped increase his, his dominance, his military might, and allowed him to better fend off the especially strong military that he faced, you know, such as the American. But yeah, a lot of these, you know, Mussolini needed Hitler to come bail him out from, uh, let's see, was it, was it Greece? I want to say it was Greece. But yeah, he, because cause he was like, oh, wow, Hitler's really making moves all over the place. Maybe I should do that. And he just completely bungled it. And yeah, just back to making my point. I'm not saying that Kylo Ren is a better character than Darth Vader. But I think it would be extremely boring if he was exactly like Darth Vader. And today, there is room for the bad guys to be complicated. Darth Vader doesn't get to be complicated until the very ending of Episode 5. You know, very few audience members knows in their social circle, have ever met in their real life, someone who resembles Darth Vader. But a number of them do know someone who resembles Kylo Ren. And before they watched this trilogy, they maybe didn't realize this individual might need, you know, a, a, a therapist, medication, something. And John Boyega plays Finn, a member of the Resistance, former Stormtrooper, FN 2187 defected from the First Order. And, yeah, several critics have pointed out Finn has nothing to do in this movie other than shouting other characters' names in a dramatic way. And Oscar Isaac as Poe Dameron, a high-ranking X-Wing fighter pilot and commander of the Resistance, who later inherits the rank of General. And, yeah, one critic points out, Poe can't catch a break for the third movie in a row. Just comic relief. Yeah. And Carrie Fisher, R.I.P. as Leia Organa, the Force-sensitive leading general of the Resistance, mother to Ben Solo, Luke Skywalker's twin sister, Anakin Skywalker's daughter. Fisher, who died in late 2016, appears through the use of repurposed, unreleased footage from The Force Awakens. And... A number of critics point out they have to write around it, and it's very awkward. As a result of her death, Fisher was not present in most of the film's marketing materials or merchandise. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, producers had a big role planned for Leia. Lucasfilm president Kathleen Kennedy said that Carrie Fisher grabbed me and said, I'd better be at the forefront of Nine. Because Harrison was front and center on Seven, Mark is front and center Eight she thought Nine would be her movie, and it would have been. After her death, Todd Fisher and Billy Lord granted Disney and Lucasfilm permission to use Carrie's likeness in the form of unused footage. And, yeah, so, a critic points out, as terrible as this sounds, none of Leia's scenes felt natural. It had probably been better to not have her in the movie at all. I'm afraid I disagree. I, yeah, I do agree. Is what I meant to say. Yes. It's just, yeah. It, um, I, I didn't write it down, but other critics have pointed out, basically it feels like Leia would walk into a shot and say something relatively neutral, something that could be repurposed, and obviously was. She'd walk into a shot and be like, Talk to me. Never underestimate a droid. Never say that. You could be mistaken. You know, things like that. Then it would cut to an over-the-shoulder. Another character would explain something to her. And then it would cut back and Leia would look... 
Like she like she had the weight of the world on her shoulders. She would maybe you know may, maybe saying we we can still do it or something like that. But there would never be a like you can always tell you can I believe that if you showed this movie to someone who didn't know Carrie Fisher from anything else, didn't realize that she was dead when they made this movie, they w they might not be able to tell that's repurposed footage, but they'd be able to tell that something was off. They'd, they'd know that there was something that was different than what it should be. It never feels like... Like the other actors are... I, I, I really commend the other actors for trying. They are they are sharing a scene with an actor that isn't there. Some some of them were like really big fans of hers, and they had worked on her, worked with her on the first two movies in this trilogy. And they really, you know, they they were so happy that Leia was in a Star Wars movie again. And so you know, it's it's crushing, it's soul crushing to them to stand there and have to pretend like she isn't gone. And they st they pull through. They really try to sell it, but it is unsellable. It is simply no one buys it. It it's just it is not possible. You can't convince anyone with with it. And I think they should have just written her out completely. Ultimately, I think the movie would have been better. Again, I hate to say this, if she, you know, I realize she didn't die in episode 8. So this movie had, you know, this movie can't just, like, pretend that she did die in episode 8. Although, it pretends a bunch of things happened differently in episode 8 than they did. But I think that they should have had her pass away between movies. You know, have someone, like, actually, yeah, you know what? You could have had characters say... I just can't believe she's gone. Have another character respond, we all miss her, but we have to fight on. It's what she would have wanted. I really feel like that would be a better way to pay tribute to just such a great actress and script doctor and just inspiring human being. You know, yeah, just... I, I get why they did what they did. And I don't, I don't think that, you know, unlike a lot of other decisions made in, in the production of this movie, I don't get the sense that they did it because they thought it would make more money. Or that it, you know, I don't get the sense that it was some studio note. Needs more Leia. People expect Leia. I don't know, figure it out. You figure it out. You know, some... I really, it really feels like they wanted Leia to be in the movie. JJ wanted Leia to be in the movie. I just, I do think that they made the, I, I think they made a mistake of how to handle it. I, I think she should have passed between movies. People should have been talking about, you could have had it be a running thing. Like at the start of the movie, people start talking about how much they miss her, how hard it is that she's gone. And gradually over the course of it, they, you know, they, they turn that frustration and sadness and grief into anger and they use it. And by the end of the movie, you know, yeah, you could, you could like have one of, you could have a villain say, you don't even have General Leia anymore. And like, one of the heroes gives this really badass response that I really should have thought of before I started this sentence. I'm going to try to think of something as I talk so there's no dead air. Hoping that this isn't too distracting. She's here in spirit or she's alive in us. Something like that, you know. And Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, humanoid protocol droid in the service of General Leia Organa. Maybe it's just me, but a lot of his lines in this felt like they were written by someone who realized that C-3PO is 
bad at figuring out social context, but they forgot that he's supposed to be like a butler, an, an interpreter, you know. He's basically there to try to do, you know, he's, he's there to help diplomats, and and he's frequently out of his depth. He doesn't like being on spaceships. He doesn't want to be in danger. You know, he's not, he's not by his nature a courageous, you know, he has, you know, so he's not technically like human, but he does have a personality. He has feelings. And in this, it just kind of felt like, you know, yeah, this definitely he does and says things that it's like, I mean, he's definitely misunderstanding the social, he's, he's not understanding that what he's saying and doing right now really isn't the right time to do it or say it. But it's just like, there's this part where he and other characters come upon this celebration and he says something like, this, you know, it's, we're so fortunate to be here. Like people, you know, this this festival is known as something that, like, you know, the the food is really tasty and, like, ah, oh, it's you know, every, people are so happy, and it's just, I don't know, I, maybe it's me. I just feel like that's not really something C three PO would would have said in one of the other movies. Like, I I don't know. I'm I mean, I guess I just feel like. You know, okay, so he's at this festival. He would maybe be like, There's, wow, there's a toy Darien. Oh, uh, a hut. Is, is that on guard plot? Okay, so he died in episode seven, so it wouldn't be on guard plot, but you know, stuff like that. And he'd look at the others and be like, I could talk to any of these people. You know, okay, so the attitude is slightly wrong, but, but that's, you know, he would convey. You know, if any of you require me to translate their languages, I want you to know I am well versed in their language. You know, something like that. And it would be like, that's not what we, that's not the situation here. You know, but him talking about, oh, their their food tastes great. Okay. And Naomi. Aki as Jonna, I suppose I'm not going to give away too much about her character. I really appreciate, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, diversity. These these three movies still don't have that many women of color. That it's it's that kind of thing of like, okay, we'll do one minority type, but not two. So you'll have a black man or a white woman, but there aren't that many black women. You know, one of one of the most prominent black women in the, the trilogy, Lupita Nyong'o, yeah, she's there. And you, you know, you can tell from her voice that she's African-American. But she's, we, we never do see her, her, her skin color. So, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think there might, there might be people out there who don't even realize that she's played by a black woman. They, they might think it's a, you know, a white woman doing black scent or something, you know, or, or, you know, some people who don't hear that many black people speak in things who might not even realize that she's not white. So, you know, and, and not, not to mention a bunch of female characters in, in fiction are, you know, if, if you don't see their face, they might be played by, a you know, a, a man with a, you know, fairly high voice, high Pitched voice. I want to. I want to say that's what it's called. I forget. You know. So, yeah. But yeah, Naomi Aki, a woman of color, and Donald Gleason once again plays General Hux, the First Order's third in command. Richard E. Grant plays Allegiant General Pride, high-ranking general, second in command of the First Order. Previously served the Galactic Empire. And, yeah, so Lupita Nyong'o as Maz Kanara, former space pirate, ally of the Resistance. Right, according to IMDb Trivia, unlike the previous films, Maz Kanara was achieved with an animatronic puppet. With creature artist Neil Scanlon, this, which 
described as probably the most advanced animatronic ever made. And that's that is legitimately cool. And it is more convincing than it was in episode seven, for sure. But that does I I feel like I heard that originally Lupita Nyongo did the uh mocap for the character back when she was animated you know now it means that the character is you know the only thing she can, is able to contribute to the character is the voice so you know because she's not the puppeteer if she was the puppeteer she could add you know but I mean I'm almost certain I don't I don't think very many animatronics are handled by actors it tends to be the you know the the people who have more experience with it. So yeah, and yeah, Junas Swatomo as Chewbacca, a Wookiee and first mate of the Millennium Falcon. He's not given a lot to do, but he is important in some ways, and you know the, he does. Con Junas Swatomo gives a great performance each of these. It's, it's really, really, yeah, like, if you don't know, I don't think you'd be able to tell that Peter Mayhew, R.I.P., is no longer playing Chewbacca. You know, he sadly passed away. I want to say, I want to say Solo was the first movie where he had passed away by the time they were making the movie. I don't think he was in the suit for very much, possibly not any of episodes seven and eight he was he you know he helped with the performance he gave advice and such kelly marie tran as rose tico a mechanic in the resistance and friend of finn so i found almost no racism in the 100 most upvoted imdb user reviews on which is a huge contrast from the ones for episode eight i guess they were pleased rose one is in a lot less of the film this time there is still some sexism, and this is the first Star Wars. Uh, actually, oh, come to think of it, I'm not 100. Yeah, I'm I'm not 100 certain if it's the first, but this one does. You know, all 100 of them are negative towards the film. And yeah, curious to point out, you know, because a number of people hated her in Episode Eight, she's barely in this movie. Yeah, you know, as as far as I understand, she was under contract to appear in this movie. So, you know, I honestly I wouldn't have ruled out they might have completely gotten rid of her because of how many people hated her character, if not for the. But but yeah, it's it's really messed up. That you know they they shouldn't have bowed to toxic fans. You know, one, once again, if you don't like the the character, that's fine. If you think that the actress gave a bad performance, you're allowed to have that opinion, and I don't think there's anything wrong with expressing the opinion. I I don't know that I would express it to, like don't don't like at her on Twitter, unless it's like constructive criticism, you know like let you know let's say that you were saying you know I liked I th I thought you you came across in episode 8 as convincing in in the social justice aspect i did not think that the the kiss between you and finn was convincing you know maybe for maybe next time try to work a little harder on romantic chemistry you know that's fine but don't like but yeah but she got harassed a lot a lot of people acted as though she like wrote the character she didn't write the character she performed the character as written and directed and a lot of the the negative you know yeah a lot of the harassment that she faced was racially charged misogynistic and fat phobic and it's just it's just really repulsive i i i think i might have said it before in one of these movies just again if you don't like her character that's fine if you express that viewpoint online, as long as you're not being hateful about it, that's fine. But if you send hatred towards someone who worked on one of these movies 
because like if you're gonna send hatred towards someone like i guess i understand if they express hatred towards someone else you know you know two wrongs don't make a right but i can understand it but if decisions made about how a character is depicted in a piece of fiction make you attack someone involved in you know crafting that piece of fiction i don't think you deserve star wars i really don't you 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 should know better star wars has always been about how our differences make us stronger like watch a star wars movie any star wars movie and it's a bunch of people from different places working together you know and that's why they succeed that's why the bad guys fail because they are the, you know there there is, there's no new blood in the empire there are no new ideas in the empire they are old white men who have nothing but military might pride and they, they feel the certainty that they're superior and that is why they fail that has always been the message of star wars from the very first movie all the way through there are more minorities represented in the sequel trilogy than the original trilogy because today it is at least perceived to be that there is more room for that kind of thing but just you know in in the original trilogy they were robots or aliens and some of them were you know kenny baker the uh sometimes i have trouble remembering i want to say the word is dwarf kenny baker right now i'm struggling to remember if he huh i don't see it mentioned if he is uh i'm just really quickly gonna look up i forget if he is still alive or not i will try to avoid any dead air a, a number of the it, yes most of the other than the the I believe the word dwarf is politically correct. I, I really don't mean to offend. At a little people. There were some little people in them. You know, the the um, the Ewoks, the Jawas. Not a big surprise. Not, not surprising. They were, you know, played by... But... Yeah, other than that, a number of them are white guys, but it expresses a love of diversity through how many of them are aliens and robots and such. Right, Kenny Baker died in 2016, so, you know, yeah, back when he was live, you know, he... Yeah, you know, yeah. Everybody remembers R two D two, and you know, probably most people, other than like children, most people realize, you know, he was a dwarf. He was a little person. So, you know, yeah. There's that, and Princess Leia, Lando Calrissian. So there's a little bit of diversity, but like, and and you know, obviously a number of them are humans, but that might also be like. Today, you can make everybody an alien of a different species. But back then, like, it took longer and was less cost-effective to make, you know, to do the makeup, for example, do the suits and such. But, yeah, it's right from the start. Like, the core group is very diverse. So, I, yeah, I, I don't even know how you watch Star Wars and not realize that diversity is one of the main points of the entire... Anyway, so yeah, I already mentioned that the Emperor is back. Ian McDermott once again plays Emperor Palpatine. And... So, I am not going to go too much into his character in this, but I will say 
he still really puts in the effort. He still gives a really strong performance. You know, he is, when, when they made this movie, he was up in, in years, you know. He, yeah, he still really does what he can to sell it. You know, he hadn't played the role since 2005, so 14 years. At, at least physically, I can't rule out he might have voiced the, the character in something, but yeah. That is legitimately, yeah, I don't think they should have brought him back, but if they were going to, I appreciate that he puts in the effort, and they tried to write him to be compelling. I don't think they, I think largely they failed, but they tried. They, they didn't just put him there and just, oh, there, just, ev everything's fine now, let's just move on. They, they made an effort. And Let's see. yeah, and and Billy Lord, Greg Grunberg reprised their roles. Dominic Monaghan. Yeah, you know, several of the I forget exactly who pointed out, but some of the cast in this are just JJ's old TV buddies, you know, they're they're good. I like them, but it does feel like you know he just wanted to bring them back, wants to throw some work their way. Now, director JJ Abrams provides the voice for Dio, a, I suppose, I'm not going to give away exactly, what, and he does give a perfectly decent performance, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing where, like, sometimes directors will greatly overestimate how appealing they are on camera, and just put them, you know, he is, he is not M. Night Shyamalan, he really does not push past what he can convincingly do as as an actor you know he doesn't do a lot but that's you know that is the better option and the, yeah the character's not supposed to be this great like yeah he's just he's a neat little character that's honestly partially there for the toy sales but he's he's perfectly decently handled and i just i really appreciate when you know, someone puts themselves into the, the thing they're directing and they don't give them, you know, M. Night Shyamalan just, he would give himself way too big roles and just, it would be so awkward to, to watch him, because he's, I, th I think he has talent as a director. He, he sometimes really overestimates his talent. He, he, he has a tendency to not realize his limitations, but as an actor, I, yeah, he's just, he's really not good at that at all. And, and again, I don't, I have no ill will towards him. I, I think he is someone who largely, he tries to make the movies that he thinks will be good. You know, he, he has passion and I really respect that. And, you know, I just said, you know, try not to be too critical of people without giving constructive criticism I think when he really, I think he maybe, it would be good if he got some very honest people to, to kind of go over, like, let him read at least a draft of your script and, and invite any feedback they have. Because when he applies himself, I maintain Unbreakable and Split are incredible movies with with very strong acting performances and their acting performances that you didn't expect like everybody knew that I can't I'm blanking on his name but yeah the the James McAvoy you know by 2016 everybody knew that he was a great actor but I don't I don't think any of us expected that he had 
quite the range that he displays in that movie. Bruce Willis, I'm not... I mean, I guess after Sixth Sense, people were ready to accept Bruce Willis as someone who could pull off this more subdued performance, that he doesn't have to run around shooting people to be fun to watch, you know, but the, 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 yeah, great movies, great acting performances, he got great performances out of these talented, granted, actors, but you do still, like, performances like that don't come without a talented director, a, a good actor's director. Now, right, and let's see, Warwick Davis yet again appears. I don't think I'm going to talk about as what, but yeah, it's, it's always great to see him in, in the Star Wars thing, and he does tend to pop up. In, in these. And let's see. Yeah, there are some cameos from famous people that. Yeah, it's. it's Yeah. John Williams, Kevin Smith, Michael Giacchino, Lynn Manuel, Miranda, and Jeff Garland. And that's, yeah, that's very cool that they, and, huh, okay, I'm sure someone was asking for Ed Sheeran to cameo as a stormtrooper, so does Carl Urban, Donnie Harrison, Donnie Harrison, is that, no, wait, I was about to say, is that Harrison Ford's, but then their last name would be Ford, not Harrison, never mind. Nigel Godrich, J.D. Dillard, and Dave Hearn. And... Yeah, uh, it's not really a, a spoiler to say, there is a tiny bit of LGBTQ, uh, you know... I forget the word, but yeah, representation is the word, but it feels very, it, it feels like it's just there to tick a box, and that really, it really is too bad. I think there is a compelling Star Wars story in an LGBTQ, you know, in, in a relationship between whether it be trans individuals or, you know, one trans, one cis, uh, whether they be gay, bisexual, asexual, whatever, you know, there's some Star Trek that, uh, I, I guess, not explicitly any of those, but have been read to represent those, and they didn't always handle it equally well, but they made the attempt, and you know, like, at, as long as you do fairly well, and it's clear that your heart's in the right place, I, I, I'm not the right person to say whether you should for sure do it, if you, if you can't be sure to do it really well, but I think, at the very least, like, we need more people who are willing to do it, and willing to really put in the effort in Hollywood. So, quoting film critics, while the performances are still on point, everyone is still really charismatic, the dialogue is terrible. The first 30 minutes of this is constant exposition. So much happens, the movie is overwhelming. Very true. Ex-Stormtrooper Finn and Maintenance Engineer Rose are completely sidelined, their brand of quiet power and everyday courage not required here, and certainly not deemed of any worth. Rise brings in another token non-white 
non-male in order to pretend it is diverse, but mysterious low tech warrior Jana, Naomi Acne, Lady Macbeth, Doctor Who, ends up with almost nothing to do too. It's really frustrating. And yeah, so diversity in casting is one thing. Does it actually understand the unique perspectives of its minority characters? I mean, it's not, it doesn't particularly make an effort to, which I, th I think there's really something there. You know, there's, there's something interesting in casting a black man as someone who has been forced into a situation where they're expected to commit violence, they refuse to commit violence, but other people still look upon them as if they are violent and dangerous. You know, that is, that is a, a, a metaphor, as a metaphor for the black experience, there's some, there's some weight to it. There's, there's something interesting there, but it's like they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to capitalize on it. And yeah, it's, yeah. That brings us to the dialogue. So I'm, yeah, going to quote a fellow critic here. The dialogue is as bad and even downright laughable. The, yeah, worse than the prequel trilogy with far too much exposition and unrealistic convenences. Yeah. I forget who it was that said, but someone pointed out some of the dialogue is basically like sitcom level and... Yeah, it's really like there's there's way too much bickering between major characters in this movie, and like it, you can really tell. Okay, that this, this was made by a guy who came from television because this, like, some of this stuff you could easily like. It feels like it could have come out of one of the more comedic scenes of Lost or Alias. The cinematography is handled by Dan Mindell. And yeah, so he has DP'd a number of different movies. So yeah, the ones of them I've seen are The Force Awakens, Mission Impossible 3, which are both movies that, you know, so he DP'd four. JJ and JJ, you know, there's this joke of, you know, JJ has his Rolodex. He, he really loves, can, you know, yeah, bringing the same people back. You know, if you look at how many people on Alias appeared at some point on Felicity, you know, you, yeah, you might be surprised how. And, and, yeah, he'll he'll bring them back for, for later stuff. Yeah. Anyway, other stuff that Dan Hindel, Mindel DP'd is Pacific Rim, Uprising, The Cloverfield Paradox, Zoolander 2, The Amazing... Or, right, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, I also watched. Star Trek Into Darkness, Savages, John Carter, Star Trek... Right, yeah, both of his Star Trek movies he also DP'd. Both... Anyway, Domino... Skeleton Key, which I watched, Stuck on You, Spy Game, Sand, and two more I watched, Shanghai Noon and Enemy of the State. Yeah, he is tremendously talented. And he really did, you know, he did the, he used the right approach on this, which, like, it would have been very frustrating if he tried for one of the other, yeah. It tends to be easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. The cinematography is not hyperactive when it should be more calm, like for dialogue scenes. I'm not sure there are any unnecessary shots. And the editing was handled by Marianne Brandon Stefan, and Stefan Grube. And Marianne Brandon has edited Love and Thunder which is, yeah, in post-production, a 
or was when I copied in this. Yeah. Venom, let there be carnage, which, I mean, I really don't think she's to blame for that movie. I think they basically forced her to edit some of it as badly as it ended up being edited. Same thing for the first Venom movie. And let's see, The Darkest Minds, the Passengers, Force Awakens, Endless Love, Star Trek Into Darkness, Super 8, Kung Fu Panda 2. Power Ranger Dragon, Star Trek 1, Genosian Book Club, Mission Impossible 3, so yeah, he, she has also worked on a number of other movies by J.J. Abrams. A Thousand Acres, Grumpier Old Men, Born to be Wild, Bingo, Race for Glory, and Old Fair. And Stefan Rube has edited The Front Runner, Tully, Clover, wait, 10 Cloverfield Lane, and The Unrecovered. And yeah, largely the editing keeps it easy to follow fast moving scenes like action scenes. Keeps more calm when that is called for, like dialogue scenes. I'm not sure there are any entire scenes that, should, uh, well, I suppose it would, yeah, it, basically the scenes that end up being undone by the a later development. But I think they should have, I'm not sure they could have edited around that. that that's more of a scripting problem. It's too late by the time it got to the editing room. And let's see. Yeah, so the Yeah. Quoting a little critic here. It's as if the filmmakers worried they might bore the audience if any one shot held their gaze for more than two seconds. How do you make a movie that feels more like a video game than the one-take war film everyone's talking about, which is 1917? Yeah, that's... 100%, yeah, this feels more like a video game. And that movie definitely feels like a video game. I, I love it, and I love video games. I, I don't even necessarily think it was the wrong choice for that movie. I think, it you know, it's something you kind of have to accept it. Once you accept it, it's fine. But, yeah, the, the you know, it, it's the kind of thing that can really bother you. I, I think for some people, the, the movie, the, that choice really doesn't work. But, yeah. I, th I think it really worked to, to make it feel, what's the word? Immersive. It feels like you're right there with them. The special effects and visual effects are again great. As you know, that that's the standard for the the sequel trilogy. They 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 do an incredible job. And again, I acknowledge so do the prequel trilogy that it does have a lot of you know. Some people think it's all CG. There's a lot of it that's not CG. There's a lot of it that is animatronics, practical effects, stuff like that. The I'm trying to not be bash the prequels too much here, but just briefly, the thing with the prequels is that there's still this it feels too clean and, and neat. It doesn't feel organic and natural and gritty. Which yeah, the 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 original trilogy and the sequel trilogy feel that way. There's some really great stunt work as well. Now, the this was filmed on let's see, a number of different locations, including some of the desert of Jordan. And let's see, of course, some studios. Back lots. Yeah. Right, and they, yeah, they filmed it from the 1st of August of 2018 to the 15th of February 2019. That's a pretty decent amount of, of time dedicated to it. But it is also a film that, like, a lot happens. There's a lot of different settings. And... 
Yeah, so according to IMDb Trivia, look of the red honeycomb zone of the unknown regions was inspired by a homemade cloud tank photograph that included, among other things, pieces of grocery store bought chicken suspended in a red lit aquarium photographed by Industrial Light and Magic art director James Cly. And that brings us to the action. We again have, you know, chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while vehicles, lightsaber action, use of the force and items, equipment, and vehicles. And. Yeah, so some critics really hated the action, thought it was boring, bland, forgettable. No decent lightsaber fight in the entire movie. Others say that it has, you know, yeah, one person says, I can't stand this movie, but it does have some of the best action in any Star Wars movie. I thought the action was well, uh, well done. I, I wish that there was more relevance, like... There are entire scenes where you barely have a chance to realize what, like, what's the goal here. Like, it's, you just see, like, there's at least one recognizable character. And you realize that, okay, so they're definitely looking to take down these beings or robots or whatever. But you don't really, you're not really told why... And I, I don't, not everything needs to be explained, but a scene just isn't going to hit as hard if you don't really know why, you know, why the characters are doing what they're doing. Un, you know, unless that's the point. And I don't, I wouldn't say that it was in the case of this movie. I would say the villains and or antagonists are fine, like, the Emperor, he was always a compelling presence, a sinister presence, and certainly in the prequels we get a sense of what he's like, you know, we see him in other situations than we did in the original trilogy. But I don't think it was interesting bringing him back. I hate the explanation. And ultimately, I, I don't think anything particularly positive was accomplished by bringing him back. And let's see. The... the This doesn't make him more interesting than he was. You know, he has some really great scenes in some of the prequels, as as well as obviously episode six. Yeah, in in this, like I do think that the you know JJ believed in him in him and I forget the name of the other writer. I think he believed wait, did JJ write it? Anyway, you know, they, they believed in him, however many writers there were on this. They just, they didn't realize that there needed to be more. I think Kylo Ren is decently interesting in this, but I felt he was a lot more interesting in episode 8. I, I will talk some more about the characters in the spoiler sections. There's stuff I could say about them that I cannot say without spoiling things from this movie. So, the music, once again handled by John Williams. To this day, the only Star Wars live-action movie that he has not done the score for is Solo. Even Rogue One, he did. 
as well as all six, all nine overall episodes. And yeah, it's it's good. I'm I'm not sure. I wouldn't say it's quite as memorable as episode eight, but yeah, you know, it's it's never it's never bad. He's never delivered a bad Star Wars score. Again, some really great sound design. You know, aliens, robots, beings and phenomena that sound like something that belongs in Star Wars. And it's like a created sound. It's not that it sounds like something that, that exists in the real world. So the pacing... Yeah, I'm going to quote a fellow critic here. The pace of the first 30 minutes was super rapid and then didn't stay consistent. They just kind of pasted scenes together, but who cares? It's cool if you have a lightsaber out, right? It was definitely very awkwardly paced. I, I wouldn't say that it was ever slow or boring, but there are definitely, like, there are scenes that really feel like they're they're terrified that the audience is starting to lose interest. You know, I, I get why, like, it must be very frustrating to be an action movie director today and have to constantly, sh like, try to live up to an audience weaned on YouTube and TikTok you know trying to deliver action enough action fast enough action big enough action that it keeps our attention you know back in my day I I do remember when action movies had substantially less action I've watched action movies from very far back let's see I guess the oldest I don't know do do noir movies count as action movies I mean, not really by today's standard, but by back then standards, I guess. So, I guess the oldest action movie I've seen is from, I guess the original uh, Scarface, probably back then, was considered an action movie, wasn't it? So, yeah, uh, 30, 32, 39, it's, it's around there. So, yeah, that's the, that's probably the oldest action movie I've seen in. By today's standards, it really does not have very much action, but yeah, you know, what What are you going to do? You, you got to compete with, once again, like, like TikTok is always going to have something that no movie is going to have. Meanwhile, if you tried to put a lot of stuff that appeals to people who love TikTok into movies, it would feel really awkward, so yeah. The movie is two hours and twelve and a half minutes long without end credits and two hours and twenty-two minutes long with them. And I mean, is it worth the investment of time? I guess maybe at least once. I feel like if you if you just once sit down and take it in and just kind of bathe in this absurd kind of like it is it is wild to me some of the creative decisions made here i legitimately could not i if if i spent years i would never be able to write something that goes to the places that this does and i've written a few pretty wild things and no don't worry i will never subject you to them I, what what could you possibly have done to me to deserve that? Now the so so yeah the best element of the movie. It's it's a tie between the action scenes not as as, as being entertaining not as they they don't always make perfect sense and they don't always flow anyway. 
a tie between that and overall the best variety of the settings of the sequel trilogy. There really are some very memorable, different looking, yeah. Would it be worth watching? Yeah, I'd, I'd say at least one view, especially if you already have Disney Plus, you almost might as well. The worst aspect is a tie between the, the fan service, the retconning, and the, the writing relying on an absurd amount of ridiculous coincidences. And I think that is a big deal. I was most worried about JJ's disappointing answers to questions brought up. And yeah, the movie uh, did even worse than I thought. Some of these answers, holy crap. The thing I was most looking forward to was something that felt like part of Star Wars, and the movie lived up to my expectations. I'm not sure I would necessarily say that it exceeded them, but, you know, better than nothing. The trailers do give away too much. Uh, I, th I think pretty much all of them give at least a little bit too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie's like. If you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. And I would definitely say the trailers are worth watching. Now, the, the cover and poster, maybe a little bit... They do give away maybe a little bit too much. They do also give you a good idea of what the movie's like. And... So, yeah. On Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 52% from critics and 86% audience score. And the critics' consensus is Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker suffers from a frustrating lack of imagination. But concludes this beloved saga with a fan focused with fan focused devotion. The 52% is based on 512 reviews, an average rating of 6.7 out of 10. 265 fresh and 247 rotten. And that does mean that it the movie is certif or not certified. It is rotten. And the audience Let's see. Yeah, so people who made a verified movie ticket purchase, rating this 3.5 stars or higher, over 50,000 people. 86%, 4.3 out of 5 average rating. On Metacritic, it has a 53 out of 100. The user score is 4.6 out of 10. And the last user reviews when I looked were from December 20th. 2019. So yeah, that one, the users were much more critical. And then on IMDb, it has a 6.5. There are seven, or when I looked, there were 7,965 IMDb user reviews. There are 519 links in the IMDb external review section. I did not get around to checking how many of them worked. All in all, a, f a total of 400, and, when I checked, 414,055 IMDb users voted on it, leading to 6.5 out of 10, with 21.7% rating it 7, 17% rating it 8, 16.1% rating it 6, 9.2 rating at 10, 8.8 .8 rating at 9, 9.5 rating at 5. Yeah, the rest are very low. So, yeah, some people really did absolutely love it. And I do understand that. Like, I think if you... Yeah, I hope this doesn't sound really harsh. I think if you focus on the emotions that it awakens in you and you are someone who's waited you know 40 years for you know let's let's see 
This movie came out in 2019. Let's see that. Ah, and let's think. Oh yeah, yeah. 42 years. That was when the original, that when A New Hope came out. You know, if you if you watched A New Hope many times over the years, and you really love it, the original trilogy in general. This tries to deliver something that will feed that nostalgia. And I understand loving that. There are definitely movies that I love where, if I'm, you know, brutally honest, I, I will admit, movie could definitely be better. So, that's perfectly fine. And... That brings us to... Right, so... A brief list of YouTubers who have made excellent videos on this movie that I recommend you watch. Jenny Nicholson. The Closer Look videos, How to Fail at Character of the Rise of Skywalker. And How to Kill Franchise, though note that I don't agree with everything he says. And Focal Point made a quite good video response to his video. And Nando V Movies. As possible, I mention them later in this video as well. So on Disney Plus, this has, you know, yeah, it has every single Star Wars movie, almost all of the shows, at least in some countries, and yeah, extras. This has this has fifty three minutes of behind the scenes extras. A two-hour, seven-minute documentary called The Skywalker Legacy. The documentary is good even if you did not like the movie. Let's see. You know, obviously parts of it are just love fest, praising the people making the movie, talking about how amazing it's going to be, appeals to nostalgia. About as much, you know, the documentary appeals to nostalgia about as much as the movie itself does. So... A lot, and, and it features a bunch of footage of, like, interviews from back then, not just clips from the movies. But, yeah, it's it's real good. I would definitely recommend. I'm, I'm more happy that I watched, you know, some of the extras, I'm more happy that I watched them than the movie itself. So, yeah. Ultimately... This movie gets a rating of five awkward retcons to acquiesce to fan reactions out of ten. And, yeah, so adding it to the list, it's, ah, adding it to the ranking. So once again, all 11 Star Wars movies, live action, Star Wars movies from worst to best. Episode 2, 3, 1, 9, 6, 7, Rogue One. Episode 4, 5, and 8. I forgot to put Solo in there. Let me think. I believe Solo was... Ah, crap. I th was it maybe lower than 7? I think it might have been lower than 7. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, to me, better than the prequels, but not as good as Episode 6. And once again, there's I have issues with Episode 6. And that brings us to the spoiler sections. So, the rest of the video... Can, you know, final warning, the rest of the video contains spoilers, including for, uh, yeah, spoilers for all 11 live-action Star Wars movies. And if you want to watch my videos on any of the other, uh, you know, what, any of the other 10, there will be a link to a playlist with all of my vlogs on Star Wars, you know, movies and games. I, if I recall, I did not 
video review that one. I guess I didn't video review either of those either. I did video review that one, including Mysteries of the Sith. So, thought section. So, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MST3K, riff tracks, other jokes, etc. Especially jokes in the next thought section. Time codes for all sections are in the description box. And the section right after this one is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So, that brings us to notes taken while watching. The Dead Speak in Fortnite. Every Star Wars fan is playing Fortnite, right? No? Ah, Seth. I will admit, I think the opening with Kylo lightsabering a bunch of fools is very badass, but it does kind of smack of the director trying to convince the audience, look, he's cool again. Remember when you thought he was cool in Episode 7? I know you didn't think he was cool in Episode 8, and who wants him to be complex anyway? I have died before. It tickled. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities, including referencing the one part of the prequels that everyone agrees rocked. I enjoy watching the Falcon fighting TIE Fighters, but it just feels like JJ is desperately trying to remind people of Episode 7, like, yeah, I, d I did like that part of Episode 7. I liked when Poe was flying, Finn was, was shooting, and they were, like, encouraging each other. You know, Finn gets off a really good shot, and he's like, Did you see that? Did you see that? And Poe's like, I saw it. That's great. You know, it's not verbatim, but something like that. You know. What are you doing? Hyperspeed skipping. I mean... I think that's a perfectly fine way to refer to something that completely changes the rules of how hyperspeed has worked up to this point. Honestly, why not just have some brief line about how it's completely new technology? That's why we haven't seen it in the other... Like, just, you know, as soon as he says hyperspeed skipping, just have Finn ask, why haven't we done this before? And have him, you know, Finn... I need to do something about my back. And have Poe respond, you know, it's a new technology. I don't know, maybe Maz Kanata. I guess maybe not her personally, but she knows someone who just cracked this technology. Something. Be with me. Be with me. They're not with me. Maybe they think it's try hard of you to do a somersault when all you're actually doing is landing from levitating? I'm starting to think it's just not possible. I mean, this whole idea of reintegrating a recently deceased actress and make it not super obvious. We decoded the message from the First Order spy. It confirms the worst. Oh, so the message was the script for the movie. They call it the Final Order. First First Order, finally Final Order. Well, the naming convention makes sense. We go together. We may be sold separately, but we go together. I mean, Ray doesn't even have a conversation with Leia that couldn't have been a conversation with someone else. You know, she's explained the situation for her training. She set up the first of several fetch quests. These are things that she could have said to, like, Finn, possibly even Poe, even though they barely have a relationship before this movie. It's just so obvious that, you know, the actress... Yeah. They, they had the problem that the actress was dead. As I've said before, it just feels disrespectful to bring an actress or any artist back from the dead like this. Obviously, we all want Leia to play an important role in a Star Wars sequel, but sometimes things just don't work out the way we want. Huh. The Knights of Ren. Them? 
in white satin. See what the locals know. Lo what the sequels hold. I'm going to find you. And then I'm going to turn you to the dark side. Ah, see, he wants to subtly manipulate her so that, you know, yeah, so that she ends up where he wants her. So what he does is tell her he's going to manipulate her. I mean, it's an original. I'll give him that. Irony, sir. Oh, just like your body. Because it's made of iron. Irony. Anyway, moving on. I don't necessarily like the whole thing with this night creature, but I do appreciate that at first it looks all dangerous. You know, it's all sharp teeth. And then when she heals it, it closes its mouth and opens its multiple eyes, becoming easier for us to empathize with. Let's see what we got. Looks like another merchandising opportunity. I'm almost certain that we can convince kids to bug their parents into buying this for them. Kylo flies directly at Ren, who is fortunate enough to realize, you know, that he's not going to fire. So she does, you know, one lightsaber move, takes it out. And fortunately for him, he is explosion proof, which totally does not lower the stakes for all of his scenes from here on out. Finn, there are things you don't know, like how many more times the script is going to call for you to shout my name and not matter much to the plot. Looks like someone has treated him badly. Maybe they thought he was a bad robot? Babu in the back, party in the front. And Ray finds what's left of Vader's helmet. You know, I like the room she finds it in, I just don't think enough of it is white. Ray, be brave. You're gonna need it for the terrible life that we just condemned you to. It kinda seems like we could think of a better way to keep you safe, but here we are. He killed my mother and my father. He should prepare to die. So on Exegol, heroes arrive and John I, what was her name? Jana, I want to say, uses this device and then looks shocked. So she must have realized from its readings that she's in a J.J. Abrams directed Star Wars movie. It was an instinct, a feeling. What? A feeling beats believing. Poe, we gotta go after her. If I can't be close enough, to her character to effectively shout her character name, what am I gonna do in this movie? Look at yourself. She was a couple seconds ago. Ray, I'm back to shout your name uselessly. And Ray manages to stab Ben with his own lightsaber and then through the force feels that Leia was finally allowed to die with dignity. Kijimi is in range. Fire on the earth until the water has vaporized into air. I can't do this alone. I need you. Not gonna lie, I will always be here for their friendship. And, you know, some people have read it to be more than friendship. I think that would be great, but obviously Disney does not have the guts to actually have, you know, an openly gay relationship, which is, I, I forget who, but one critic pointed out that's why he has the love interest in, in this movie. Both of them are given love interest, you know, no homo, don't worry, no homo. A Jedi's weapon deserves more respect. What are you doing? Desperately trying to course correct to satisfy fans who just want this to be original trilogy 2.0, just like you are. Okay, if they have to use technology to resurrect a dead actor and then de-age them, it should definitely be for something as amazing as showing Leia Jedi training. Luke raises up the X-Wing. Remember Yoda did this in Episode 5? You love that. 
forget the fact that this ship has been underwater for, I mean, I guess by now, decades. Episode 8 clearly showed that one of the wings was now the door to Luke's hut. There's no way that thing still flies. In Episode 5, Luke's ship had only been underwater for hours, maybe days. Huge difference. And I forget, I did it, am I remembering right? Did it play the Yoda music as he was raising? Just, wow. And I, I, I've seen people online who love the original trilogy who feel legitimately offended, disgusted by the scene. You want to put what in my head? Under no circumstances. See, I keep telling you, nobody in this movie wants the entire script in their head. It's just too much frustration. And as usual, a droid's request for bodily autonomy is violated. So I said my video on episode 8, but in case you didn't watch it, or just either way, bears repeating, I don't think the idea that the whole door maneuver is one in a million means that it is difficult to plot the course. I agree, that's ridiculous. It's a huge target they're going for. I think the idea is that there's something else that makes it incredibly difficult. The reason they phrase it that way is to reference the end of episode 4. That doesn't mean that it's difficult for the same reason. Now... I was, there was something in the climax of this movie that legitimately shocked me. We actually have horses in space. In space. In space. I mean, at least the Ewoks could make tools and build huts. That makes it at least slightly easier to believe that they could play a significant role in taking out such a major threat. But I, I don't have a problem with, with horses, despite the ongoing rumor. I say nay to that, but the idea of riding a space horse on a ship, like, don't, I, I get, they're not close enough, ah, wait, no, wait, actually, come to think of it, they're too far away from the planet for there to be, no, there's definitely no atmosphere on that thing, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say that, that no, that is a problem, you know, we, we, it has been established, there is, you know, you, you can't just, move through space in Star Wars without something covering you, without the, the let's say, I want to say it's called a lack of atmosphere, without that affecting you. You know, we do see that that happens to Leia in Episode 8. She just recovers from it. So, yeah, there's, there's no way there... Wait, does the, the long, flat ship make... No, that can't be right. I mean, you couldn't climb on the outside of a space shuttle just because it's flat. Now, I, th I think there is a problem there, but it's just also, yeah, it's just, it's so silly. They're riding on the outside of the ship. I'm really not sure why the Final Order people on the ship don't just like, like, okay, so this is the ship. These are the people riding on it. You realize that if you tilt, they slide off. Like there's nothing. Like these are these are just regular horses. This like they even they even bring up. Oh, are they on speeders? You know, he says jam their speeders, which is of course there to explain why they're not on speeders. But it's it's there to sell the toy. You know, it's there because some people want. Space Horses in Star Wars, and I have no problem with that, but at least in Episode 8, there was a reason for, you know, but yeah, in, in this, it's just, yeah, it's, it's one of the silliest, 
It's so easy for them to be defeated like that. And the movie realizes that because later, like near the very end of the movie, near the very end of the climax, it's already near the end of the movie, as the ship is crashing, they do slide down it and almost die. So, like, I don't know. I mean, couldn't they have had special shoes that, like, Erewhon style, you know, magnetically lock them to the surface? Not, not like, every second, but in case, like, the ship tilts. Anyway. So I will comment on the endgame similarities in the next section. Ben and Kiss, Ben and Ray kiss to satisfy the Raylo fans in the audience, and then he dies to reassure everybody else that it will never happen again. I mean, unless they pull up Patrick Swayze, R.I.P. Demi Moore down the line. All the good guys celebrate. There's a single shot of two women kissing in an attempt to appeal to the LGBT community, but it is easy to edit out for when the movie goes to China. Once again, if you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. So, that brings us to the very final section. Huh, that was shorter than I thought it would be. But then it is cold. So. This is the part where I would go into whether I'm glad that this is a sequel. I mean, it doesn't really follow up on any of the stuff Episode 8 set up that was interesting. I mean, it would have been a completely different movie if it wasn't the sequel. Honestly, if there's someone out there who, for any reason, you know, you don't, it doesn't, you don't have to explain it. It doesn't have to be, like, if there's someone watching this video and you, you know nothing about Star Wars, you, you, you know, no cultural osmosis, you didn't watch any of the movies, but you did watch this movie, I kind of want to know. How much of it could you follow? Because there's so much in this movie that's set up in the other movie. I, I would be legitimately impressed if if there was someone who, like, sat down and watched this movie. And by the end of it, they could, like, explain, like, maybe not absolutely everything, but enough that, that seriously, that that is, that would be very impressive. Now, this is where I go into whether or not the movie has empathy for the least likable characters. It definitely doesn't have empathy for the Emperor. Probably not for the Richard E. Grant character. I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I'm I really like his stuff. I'm I'm you know, I think he's given some of the best performances. I've ever seen, but I sometimes blank on names. So. That brings us. Yeah, here we go. So, a couple of things from IMDb Trivia. J.J. Abrams wanted the Death Star to sound haunted, so its interiors were recorded inside a stack of shipping containers. When he first met, met Adam Driver, J.J. Abrams said that he imagined Kylo Ren's journey would be the opposite of Darth Vader's, which, yeah, that's an interesting idea, certainly. I mean, I guess that... I'm not sure I would really, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I completely understand. For sure, like, he starts at the end. He starts almost being tempted to become, to, to turn away from the dark side. I guess, yeah, it's, 
I'm moving on. When asked if Han Solo was a Force ghost, Harrison Ford says, said, I have no effing idea what a Force ghost is, and I don't care. I will never tire of Grandpa Ford, old man yelling at Cloud, old man, you know, shouting at the kids, you know, yelling at the kids to get off his, get off my lawn, you know, just, it's, it's so funny, like, like, so many people would, would, like, try, like, you know, he's, okay, he says he doesn't know what it is, hypothetically, he could have chosen to try to, you know, is Han a force ghost? I mean, I think, I think what people define as a force ghost, I feel like we got to be careful not to, not to box it in. Like we need to have an open, just, just keep our minds open. You know, I, what you think is a force ghost might be different from what I think is a force ghost. So, so to answer the question, is Han Solo a force ghost? Yes. And no, you know, it, it could have been some completely nonsensical, but just, you know, he's, he doesn't know, and he doesn't care. Just, you know, yeah. And the really funny thing is, he's been like that since he was, like, a young guy. Like, he was, you know, the kind of stuff he said to Mark Hamill when they were making the first two movies. He already sounded like this grumpy old man, you know, even though he was like I want to say in his twenties at the time or something, you know he was he was quite young at the time, but he was you know like let's see I think it was yeah you know when he when he and Mark Hamill watched the episode five in the theater for the first time you know Mark Hamill was one of the only people who knew that you know Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father, so when that twist is revealed. You know, in, in the theater, as they're watching the premiere, Han Solo... Is, uh, I mean, is, is Harrison Ford not actually Han Solo? Anyway, Harrison Ford leaned over to Mark Hamill and is said to... I, I want to say Mark Hamill himself said that Han Solo said, You didn't effing tell me that. <laughs> you know, instead of just saying, What a twist! He was like... Why didn't you tell me? You, you know, you a-hole. Now, back to IMDb trivia. Concept art from the movie's art book sh shows a scene which never made it into the movie with Kylo Ren approaching a monstrous spider-like creature, possibly Torval Valum, the Sith Master, Sith, Sith Master from Colin Tavaro's aborted Episode 9 script surrounded by pikes on which are mounted, among others, the skulls of Jedi Master Kit Fisto and of Admiral Akbar. So what you're saying is, it's a trap! Yeah, I know. It needs, the, the impersonation needs work. In the opening scene where Kylo Ren and a driver searches for Palpatine, the latter tells him, yeah, Force the Pathway, same, exact same thing that Palpatine said to Anakin Skywalker. And... Yeah, you know, in, in Episode 3 he was talking about, you know, Darth Plagueis could use the Force to prolong a life, hinting at how it may have played a role in Palpatine's resurrection. Some fans speculate Darth Sidious won and cheated death again at the end, this time by possessing Ray's body, a power he stated to be able to do if Ray killed him, which she technically did. And if, yeah, if you go online, there are a number of people, I don't blame them, because they're just trying to make sense of this movie. He specifically said, if, if you kill me, I take over your body. I live on in your body. And then she kills him. And she kills him because he doesn't stop firing lightning. 
which might suggest that him continuing to fire lightning is a plan or intentional in some way. I mean, I don't like episode 3, but the reason he keeps firing lightning is because it makes it look to Anakin like he's in greater... Like, hypothetically, let's say that he, you know, he was like, okay, okay, chill, you know. Uh, Windu has the lightsaber pointed close to him. He's like, you know what? I can admit when I'm wrong. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I need to calm down a little bit. Maybe I'm a little bit too ambitious. Let's, let's see if we can't come to an agreement. Let's see if we can't talk to something, you know, but no, you know, then, then Anakin would be like, you know, maybe he should go on trial, but then, actually, never mind. He is the one who says he should go on trial. The, the, it's, it's Windu who says he can't go on trial anyway, but yeah. Because he keeps firing the lightning, it looks like he's in danger. It looks like he's, you know, being badly hurt rather than just making sure his face looks very similar to where the way it looks in episode 5. But in this movie, yeah, like, why, why doesn't he just stop firing the lightning? The return of Emperor Palpatine, more specifically a clone of him, had already happened in the comic series Dark Empire part of the now decanonized Star Wars Expanded Universe. Writer Timothy Zahn, one of the most prominent authors of the Expanded Universe novels, had strongly opposed the decision to bring Palpatine back, stating, It destroys Darth Vader's sacrifice in killing the Emperor at the end of Return of the Jedi. It unravels the whole original trilogy. And I have to agree. Well, I don't have to. I, I choose to. In Colin Trevorrow's aborted episode 9 script, Emperor Palpatine did not return to Kylo Ren, was the main villain of the story, although a new Sith Master, a 7,000-year-old alien named Toro Valum, was introduced. There's too little screen time devoted to the Emperor in this, so it was way less of an impact compared to episode 6. And Ray runs to the Emperor's world to kill the old man, because, you know, that's what he wants. He came back from the dead, so the child he sent away because he feared she would kill him can kill him. Motivations are super important in Star Wars. And, yeah, so quoting fellow critics, actually, I guess those last two were probably critics as well. In this movie, we finally see Kylo Ren as Ben Solo. There's humor, passion, humanity in his character. This should have been present in episode 7 when we see Ben kill Han Solo. We don't know their relationship yet. The only thing that matters to the audience is that Han Solo, who we care about, is dying. We don't know that Ben... Or, yeah, we know that... Hmm, what did... We know that Ben is evil. Right, the fact that he's evil means that Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, and Leia Solo were unable to prevent him from turning evil, so we want to see him turn good, because it would, you know, it matters to them, but that's all. It doesn't yet matter to us, because so little screen time. Part of the problem is that this movie has to start and finish the story it wanted to tell, because... It does not finish the story that episode 8 told, since that was unpopular with fans. Now, some say that the... Yeah, the movie should not take place right after episode 8. Instead, there should be a time jump, so that there could be more good guys than there were at the end of, it, of 8. So it can start in a high, a high speed. The story should already be in media res, like episode 6, it's important that there is a villain like the Emperor, or Kylo Ren could become, could turn fully evil. The movie wants to do daring things, dramatic things, killing off characters, but every time it does something like that, it changes its mind and does the opposite, bringing them back to life not long after. It feels like while they're making the movie, the studio comes in and says, that's too daring, you have to you know, have to go back, Kate. Early in the movie, we are told that when, yeah, 
when it has been 16 hours, the Emperor's spaceships will be ready. But without a doubt, it's been more than 16 hours before the movie's over. And it's only, yeah, without them being fully ready. But then, are they fully ready at the end? Maybe, but certainly they should have been fully ready sooner. A lot of the movie is about finding the Wayfinder and then Kylo destroys it. So it feels like everything that happened up to that point in, in the movie is a waste of time. In episode 6, we actually believe there's a chance Luke might turn evil. He does evil things over the course of the movie, like strangling people to death. But in this movie, we never really believe that Rey will become evil. It feels like they're too scared of going that far, or maybe they don't completely understand why it worked in episode 6. The movie has a huge amount of references to episodes 4 through 6, but in those movies they're not just references. Stories, characters, and yeah, it's the stories and the characters that mean we love those movies, it's not the references. The biggest problem with the movie is about the characters and not the plot. One of the problems with the movie is that it tries to finish off the animated shows in addition to the nine episodes. And it has there are too many things to resolve in a single movie. Speaking of healing powers, that exact kind of power is what Anakin had spent most of his adult life trying to acquire. Everything he's done to obtain more power and knowledge, the dark side. And then boom, Rey just has it all of a sudden. Anakin turned his back on everything he was taught in an effort to acquire healing powers. Rey is just walking around healing basilisks like it's nothing. So you don't need to turn to the dark side and kill billions of people. Light side Jedis can heal all along. Anakin got pranked. Why didn't Yoda and Mace have healing powers or even know this possibility? Now to be fair, in some of the video games... You know, light side Jedi have healing powers, but yeah, in in the movies it really doesn't make sense. The bad, no storyline. Palpatine came back somehow, was confronted by Rey, and died again. It took her less than two minutes to finish him. In the end, because in the end, all because dead Jedi suddenly decided to talk to her comfort her she wasn't alone i will say i'm glad that they didn't try to do a visual ghost for each of them because you know really most yeah if i recall most of the time when you hear a jedi that you're not seeing it's a force ghost it's not just that you're hearing their voice it would have been terrible it would have been so much worse if we saw the ghosts. That would have been so sappy and silly. Now... Nearly the entire plot is one long scavenger hunt with characters jostling around in so many different environments that none of them are anything more than a noisy visual blur. They're in some jungle, then they got to go to alien Bollywood, then they randomly meet a sandworm from Dune. Disney is trying to wreak the upcoming Dune movie by getting Frank Herbert's ideas first. Chewie goes off to take a leak. The Empire captures him, so he gets rescued. Next up is some kind of oppressed, ratty Dickensian city. Then a techno club where they meet some dwarf named Babu. We have wayfinders and Sith daggers and hex charms and Death Star pieces and space horses. What the heck? Point of all this anyway? It's a manic attempt to disguise the fact that there is no story, no moral, no purpose, only flashy nonsense. Some say Kylo Ren shouldn't have been redeemed. He had his chance before this movie in both episodes, in episode 7 and or 8. 
yeah, I, I think by the end of episode 8, it was too late to have him redeemed. It, it should have happened in either episode 7 or 8, if it was going to happen. You know, if when it doesn't happen in the first two, we expect it to happen in the last. JJ handles action scenes on planets well, but the space battle is unfocused. Yeah, yeah. I I remember the space battle in Rogue One way better. And some of the space action in Episode 8 also way better. Yeah, the Emperor coming back means that Anakin Skywalker did not complete his six movie arc and killed the Emperor. It's it's such a bad idea. I, I, it's baffling to me that they actually went with that. Like, if there's one thing that every Star Wars fan can agree on, it is extremely important that Anakin Skywalker, like, the end of his arc is killing the Emperor. Bringing the Emperor back, like, at the end of the day, whether it's, like, if it's a clone, then okay, it scientifically makes more sense. The idea that he came back without cloning is completely absurd, but, you know, we do see evidence of cloning, so it might be that. But it just then does still mean it's hollow. It's like, why wouldn't he just come back after this one, too? You know, he blew up twice at the end of episode 6. I There's no reason why he couldn't come back from from this as well. Like, so he basically got melted into, like, dust, if, if he can reform, like, I don't know, I guess it's apples to oranges, where, which of the two would be harder to come back from. Anyway, yeah, some critics say Kylo is like Anakin Skywalker in episodes 1 through 3, but handled well. A young Jedi with a dark side who has a difficult time controlling his emotions. And because of that, does horrible things. There's no reason for the bad guys to have a completely new fleet because they handled themselves well with what they had before this movie. They had basically beaten the resistance by the end of episode eight. Yeah, it's it's just because JJ wanted that, you know, wanted that difference between them. If Luke Skywalker or Mace Windu had had two lightsabers, could they have deflected enough lightning to kill the Emperor? JJ humor works if you like it, but otherwise it can be really annoying. JJ runs his twist up, love series of movies about how anybody has the power to defeat evil, to preach a sermon enshrining the divine right of kings. Yeah. YMS refers to the teeth of Evil Ray as Bilbo teeth, which I quite like. And Jana is clearly there to replace Rose, and the story of the stormtroopers who broke the conditioning goes nowhere. That story was always just there as background. She's a gender swap of Finn. Yeah, yeah, what was it called again? Smurfit? principle or something to, yeah because um, you know some people think that the ideal woman for a man is just the the same as him but just as a woman so that they don't have to argue and he doesn't have to figure out how to be around you know someone who's different from him Sorry, Bliss exists to make clear that Poe must be straight. He's not actually attracted to Finn, despite the fact that the actor said that that's how he played the character in episode 7 and 8. The movie would be better if Kylo Ren were redeemed early in the movie. I don't know why that wasn't what happened. Yeah, it, it's, it's so late in the film and not really... Not really built to that much. Like, there's not really a lot of conflict 
in him the way that, you know, in episode 8, there's clearly conflict. Like, he has a chance to fire shots killing Leia, and he chooses not to. And he, you know, helps kill Snoke. Yeah. It's one thing, a depressing thing, to see that obviously there was never one any unifying vision for this trilogy. No one mapped out even a sketch of an overarching plot for the three movies. The grand story tells is damn near incoherent, because no one seems to have had any idea what it was going to be about. Way worse, though, is how, with the rise of Skywalker, the film struggles to justify that title. Star Wars became the Emperor, solidifying ideas about lineage and nobility, broadly defined, and destiny and heritage that, more than ever in today's world, need to effing die when slavish adherents to dynasty and heritage are doing so much damage. Very true. I have to wonder how many fans... That might also be like the fact that, you know, episode eight, one of the things it says is you can't be great even if you were born into a family that isn't, you know, well known in a place that isn't well known. And you're not like, yeah, you're not born into it. You know, there's way too many people today that think that the only way you can be great is if your parents are rich famous you know that kind of thing and yeah i wonder how many people you know had maybe maybe they were like going around fantasizing oh i wish i you know i wish my parents were rich celebrities and then this movie in a franchise that they love comes around and says that shouldn't be something you think you know you shouldn't want that you should want for things, you know, for, for you to be great on your own, and they couldn't, they couldn't stand that. Again, I'm not saying it's the only reason people might, you know, yeah, there are other reasons why people dislike episode 8. Every single character, save Ray and Kylo, is a plot device. The whole story was slapped together while they were scripting in shows. Such a waste of days and ruthless talent. She deserved a strong finish for the franchise that gave her a career, as well as putting Oscar effing Isaac in a leading role and not giving him much to do. Boy, the last line of the movie ticked me off when she's asked for the second time Ray who, and she pauses to think, then smiles. I was actually starting to feel a swell of emotion for what I felt had to be coming next. Just Ray. Same answer as before, but this time said not with the not with insecurity and shame, but confidence and acceptance, because it's our found family that matters, and they aren't signified by a family name. But nope. The main thing I hate about the line is how it reinforces the theme that your lineage is actually super duper important. And if yours sucks slash is egregiously evil, the best you can do is adopt a better one. The more I read about it, the more I really, really prefer the Trevorrow version that could have been, where Rey gets over her obsession with lineage and decides that just Rey is more than enough. Our master... Yes, this is from Trevorrow's. Our masters were wrong, Rey said. I will not deny my anger. I will not reject my love. I am the darkness and I am the light. You're nothing. You're no one, Kylo responds. Rey then ignites her lightsaber and says, No one is no one, before running at him and the battle continues. The line, according to Burnett, is a callback to earlier in the film when Rey is discussing her lineage with Poe and he explains that everyone is who they want to be. No one is no one. I can just imagine the line, no one is no one, resonating in the culture in a way that nothing in TROS really has. It would have been a rallying cry for anyone protesting all sorts of injustice, 
for anyone who felt marginalized, for insecure teens and unmoored adults. For everyone. No chosen one status needed. It would have been brilliant and a damn shame it was never allowed to happen. The main chunk of the story happens within 16 hours. Story-wise, would it have made that big a difference for the arbitrary deadline to be three days? Now, let's see. So yeah, in the review itself, I said that there are again, you know, countless coincidences in the script. The good guys get extremely lucky, and that's why they do so well. It's, you know, there's a lot of nonsense fetch quest treasure hunt stuff going on. Incredibly badly written. A lot of it's way too easy. You know, the fetch quests sometimes are like the national treasure movies if they were stupid. Or just kidding. I haven't actually watched any of those movies. I just thought it'd be a funny joke. I'm taking one last look at my friends. Wait, I'm looking at a bunch of strangers. I don't know, even a single one of you. Is it possible that someone could get me in a room with my friends so the line makes sense? No? Okay, then. Okay, technically, that's maybe a little... tiny bit harsh, but... I mean, the, the movie has Leia in it. You know, she has a, way more of a relationship with him. Way more years of... Yeah. So, I believe that the reason Yoda can cause a lightning strike in Episode 8 is that it's an island that's strong with the Force. He shouldn't be able to do it anywhere else. So, he shouldn't be able to do it in this movie. And, let's see... Wait. Yes, you know, maybe that's how Luke lifts the X-Wing, because it's a place strong with the Force. You know, for Force ghosts were not shown to be able to affect the, the real world, the physical world, before. So, this movie's version of the Death Star is even more foolish than Starkiller. So, it's clear that the screenwriters for this movie do not have good, any good ideas for what to do, you know, other than the Death Star that bears some resemblance, that's in that general direction. Now, we're told that they can't, uh, let's see. Yeah, the, the Holdo maneuver. Yeah, I noted here, I already talked about, you know, it's not that it's difficult to plot the course. It's a, yeah, it's, they, it was a badly written line. They should have been, they should have phrased it in a way where it was clearer. Could there maybe be a thing about only Force-sensitive people can do it? Because, you know, people are always talking about, well, if you can do that maneuver, you know, some people would be willing to commit suicide to do it. Some people, you know, others say, well, just have droids do it. But Force-sensitive people, you know, no one's eager to say, oh, just have them sacrifice themselves. And, you know... I mean, we weren't really told that she wasn't force sensitive. Yeah. So, yeah, part of the climax is that the bad guys really can't tell the difference between up and down. So they really are MAGA. So, yeah, a lot of characters in this movie die and are then brought back, or seem to die at least. So. Let's see, the, yeah, so in, well, 
Right. I am going to go ahead and I have a few comments that require me to spoil Avengers Endgame. So I can't really hold up my index finger for the entire duration. So what I'll do is in a few seconds I'm going to raise my index finger and that'll be the cue that there are going to be spoilers and then afterwards you know once once I'm done with the spoilers I will raise my index finger again so this is a time where you won't be able to fast forward through because you won't be able to tell if I did or didn't do the finger thing but it, it won't be long anyway so spoilers for Avengers Endgame start so yeah parts of the climax in this movie are stolen from the Endgame climax you know there's the part where a ton of people show up as, as backup which like it doesn't like that's there's proper setup for that in you know in Endgame they show up through you know very suddenly through portals which we were told about you know we know how those portals work it was demonstrated in Doctor Strange and we knew that the 50 percent of everything everyone had been brought back we you know we got confirmation of that you know not not very long before but we did get it before that part and then the let's see yeah you know in in this movie both of these things are here because it was popular in Avengers it's fancers yeah so I am fan service and I am all the Jedi Botch that. Never mind. I'm okay. I'm gonna do it again because I'm a tiny bit proud of, of this. So yeah, I am fan service, and I am underutilized. And let's see. Yeah, there's some chance that the reason the Emperor continues to use Force Lightning after it starts killing him is that he's like wondering where. Where's Anakin to chop the hand off of Rey, which technically would be consistent with what we've seen him before. But, you know, enough about Episode 3. They were scared to break with tradition. Technically, in Episode 6, he was also using lightning at a time where it was not a good way for him to win. You know, if he had, like, grabbed the lightsaber and just chopped Luke's head off or something, it's possible that Vader would have killed him afterwards. But using lightning enraged Vader getting him to the point where he was willing to kill the Emperor and no more spoilers for Avengers Endgame so I think maybe this bears explaining it's it's a it's a pen it's a it's a you know it's it's not just like a, a toy it doesn't work anymore so at this point it is a toy and a, and a prop for this video which you know it wasn't very difficult for me to find I hadn't like hidden it very well away I didn't buy this recently I'm not that much of a nerd for Star Wars still but I am a big enough nerd to save something that I bought when I was 12 I want to say I at least got it on sale, but honestly, I can't be 100% sure. But yeah, I, I don't know. I still think it's cool. Look at the detail on the on the hilt. You know, you got the little, you know, things sticking out, and it's just the it's, yeah. I I like it. Is what I'm saying. So.
yeah, the you know, there are a lot of situations in this movie where, you know, if the Force Ghosts spoke to, um, yeah, spoke to Ray sooner, they they could have helped the situation, but they just don't show up. You know, it's it, it doesn't even feel like like something that you would see. I, I guess it's a reference to Episode Four, where the ghost of Obi Wan tells Luke to use the Force, not the targeting computer, to make the one in a million shot. But like Yoda and Obi Wan don't talk to Luke at the end of Episode Six. I guess the prequels, like, nobody knew about the Force Ghost ability until the end of Episode 3, I guess. Qui-Gon was the only one, so. But yeah, it's like, you know, all of them show up at once. So, I, I don't know. Were they just, like, having this out-of-control ghost rager rave kind of thing? Just... I don't know. And like like suddenly one of them is like oh my head uh um guys how long has that red light been blinking? Oh oh no oh no okay uh maybe it's not too late. Let's go, let's go. Everybody remember their line, okay? We gotta make each one of them distinct. If all of us just say, would you just get up and kill this old dude? You know, that's that's not going to be very convincing. So just, you know, everybody... Yeah. I do appreciate, you know, they got, like... Is there a single one of them who's played by a different actor? I think they got everyone back. You know, Vader, both Obi-Wans, young Anakin... I want to say maybe Ahsoka Tano, but again, you know, I, I'm pretty sure there's at least one from Clone Wars. I want to say Mace Windu was one of them. Maybe Qui-Gon, you know, but yeah, a bunch of them. So that's slightly cool, at least. And yeah, it's incredibly unsatisfying to, that the... Emperor survived episode 6, according to this movie, since it was tremendously satisfying to see Anakin Skywalker kill him before he exploded, but now he's back with no detailed explanation. Why would we believe he's dead when this movie ends? Basically, we can no longer believe that he will ever truly die because of how this movie resurrects him and does it the way that it does. And honestly, all they had to do was make sure to say in the movie that it was completely out of the way. You know, the, the way that they say the whole maneuver is a one in a million, you know. I'm almost certain there's no line in this movie that says that Palpatine couldn't possibly be resurrected. And... It's very silly that, you know, Rey turns out to be Palpatine's granddaughter. Obviously, it's an attempt to make sure that, you know, the, the hero is a descendant of one of the the villains but you know we already they already did that and there was like there, there was a chance that Anakin Skywalker would be redeemed and you know there's no like I've never gotten the sense in any of these movies that the emperor was redeemable at all like he's not someone you save he's someone you stop you know by the time that we you know, in episode 6, there are these little, like, you can kind of see why Luke, like, occasionally Darth Vader will say something that suggests that there is some chance. Like, when Luke says, there is still good in you, Father, I sense it. I, I, that might not be verbatim, it's been a little while. The Darth Vader doesn't respond, yeah, right. Okay, so that's not exactly how he would phrase it. I'm, I'm giving you the, the gist of it. He says, it is too late for me. If someone says, it's too late, that might mean, you know, maybe it means it legitimately is too late. 
but it might just mean I mean I guess maybe if you were if maybe you could convince me but I'm kind of fishing for well, not compliments but yeah it's it's you know he he he's re redemption baiting and you know since this movie does not have you know I mean yeah um Kylo is redeemed but I'd say that's really more you know Han Solo's who who knows if that's a force ghost or not thing I I definitely say it's it's that much more than like Ray that you know okay Ray heals him so that maybe helps you know helps redeem him but it's just it's just not the same and you know there was already this idea of him possibly being redeemed before the emperor showed up you know in episode 7 and 8 i do kind of like you know han solo shows up and he and kylo it looks like the scene where kylo killed him and there's this sense that you know he he was trying to compel Kylo to come home. Wait, was that what he said? Anyway, someone, I saw someone online say Kylo misread the situation and now he understands what Han was really trying to do there. Anyway, I don't mind that, you know, okay, so they do, you know, they, they do the thing where the hero is related to someone evil without also having someone redeemed you know that's that's fine but it just they ha they needed to replace it with something else it's not interesting that she's related to someone irredeemably evil if nothing comes like hypothetically let's say Let's say that we changed nothing else in the movie. Let's say that the entire movie, there's no reference to her family lineage. She is still, her parents were nobodies. Wanna be somebodies. Anyway, her parents were nobodies, but she's, you know, she's getting strong with the force. So she wants she thinks she's the only one who can defeat Emperor the Emperor. And the Emperor thinks that she's the only one strong enough that he could transfer his power to her. You know, that's that solves it. You don't plot-wise, it doesn't make a difference. Which explain to me how episode six would have the same impact if Luke did not like, you know, Luke redeems his father by giving him, you know, he gets that one last chance. Hypothetically, if, if Darth Vader had let the Emperor fry his son to death, that's it. There's no coming back. But because he, you know, it's it's the very finish line. But he does do it. You know, he... Despite the fact that it means... I think there's... There's a chance that he knew it would kill him. You know, the lightning fries the some of the suit to the point where he can't live. And, and yeah, you know, the, the, it's a huge, it's, it's one of the main, it's one of the greatest strengths of episode six is the redemption and why, you know, they actually, they sort of redeem each other because Luke was getting very close to the dark side and he stops when he realizes, you know, yeah, how close he has gotten. Because the, the hand, you know, yeah. And yeah, in, um... In, in this movie, you really don't, it doesn't change anything. She's, the reason Rey is related to someone evil is because that's how it was in the original trilogy. 
you know, I don't mind that they're doing something different, but yeah, the idea that she's related to him doesn't mean that very much of the film we actually believe she ends up turning evil, which was another part of what, it, you know, it really appeals, like when you watch episode 6 and you see Luke doing these seriously messed up things, these really dark side things, you, like, the first time you watch it, especially, like, especially after the ending of episode 5, you really, there's, there's a, there's some chance that he's gonna turn. His father did, you know, the, the, and he's been doing so many evil things over the course of the movie. He's been displaying so many dark side qualities. You know, he, he threatens Jabba. You know, can you imagine, at least Ben Kenobi, maybe, maybe Obi-Wan, young Obi-Wan would. But Ben Kenobi, like, threatening some, like, he specifically, like, he's not threatening Darth Vader. He's like... You're you're only a master of evil, and if you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. You know he's not standing there like, you you know don't let's let's just get this over with. Let's you know, I forget the exact words Luke uses when when he talks to Jabba, but he like it's a yeah he's he's boastful. He he doesn't he's not very Jedi like at the time. But yeah, in, in this movie, like, yeah, this, oh, she uses Force Lightning and she f faces a version of herself that's evil. That's just, you know, yeah, yeah, okay, she stabs, yeah, and she stabs Ben when he's defenseless. Just these three things, and for the rest of the movie, you really don't get a sense. Like, did very many people think that she would end up joining him when she approaches him there at the end? Maybe maybe some did, but I, I really don't. It it played more like she's she's the hero, so she's there to defeat the bad guy. But yeah, basically the reason she's a Pal Palpatine is to explain why she's so powerful with the force for the you know, the viewers who really hate the idea that you could be that powerful without being related to someone who's powerful. Episode eight said anyone can be powerful with the force. This is not about lineage. This is not some story where only those of pure blood are allowed to be important. And then this backtracks. Now, let's see. Yeah, so in interview, some of the filmmakers say that it is a theme for this movie that if you, you know, though you have had a bad past, if you find someone who cares about you in the present, you can get into a better situation, which definitely is, yeah. The, ah, what's the word? That does come through, I think. You know, uh, Zuri and Poe. What's the word? Ray and and others, yeah. Kylo becoming Ben Solo, yeah. Third film that Finn is in, third love interest, like it's it's ridiculous. You know, you have the first one, it's Ray, then the second one, it's Rose, Tico, and then this, it's Janna, like. So in this movie, we get another suggestion for what the big threat from the Empire could be instead of another Death Star. Thousands of Star Destroyers, and that, you know, this really underlines, they have no other ideas, for, you know, for some, for a big, powerful thing that is a threat. The thought that there are thousands is not necessarily the worst idea I've ever heard. But the idea that all of them were frozen and now the Emperor rides them and they have fuel and manpower, even though they were like first. Okay, I've heard some people say, oh, it's like those are the shipyards. So they're being 
like they're crashing up through the ceilings of the shipyards like the top is what like the the what's it called nav tower is on top what if that got crushed under the ceiling that they put the or the, not ceiling roof you know do, i mean do you realize how thick a roof is I, I okay don't test it do not try to move something through a roof that's that's not going to be it's not going to work out for you it's not it's not a good idea I don't care if you're throwing it or shooting it or using a giant magnet from above. Or if you have real life telekinesis, just don't do it. It's 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 not gonna end well for you. It didn't for me, it won't for you. And yeah, you know, even for Star Wars where a lot is doable, this idea you know, these ships are absurd. I mean, some of the different games based on Star Wars, you know, some of, yeah, sometimes there are large groups of Sith that, you know, maybe you'll only face one or two at a time. But still, sometimes, you know, some of them will have a few extremely powerful... Sh yeah, what's the word? The dangerous Sith robots that are really dangerous and, and difficult to stop, ancient weapons that have the effect of making Sith extremely strong, you know, yeah, okay, so a lot of these are, you know, these are games where you run around with a lightsaber, so obviously the enemy also has a lightsaber and is extremely strong with the force, not, not all of them, but a lot of the ones that appeal to me the most are these ones, and yeah, you know, Jedi Knight, Jedi Knight 2, and Jedi Academy, yeah, you know, I would say that they could have been used here, especially since the ending has Kylo Ren help Rey. You know, I yeah, I, I think it could have been cool if they had to take down, yeah, may, yeah like maybe a two-on-two -two Jedi, yeah. You know, we've seen two-on-one we haven't seen two on two in the live action movies. I, I think it could be really cool. A sort of. Yeah, you know, some of the time they would stand back to back. You could have maybe for a while two of. Yeah, maybe one of. Maybe Kylo gets knocked into a pit. And it looks like he's not going to be able to get out. Maybe it even looks like he fell to his death. So the other two gang up on Rey. The way that, you know, there, there was some ganging up in the throne room fight in episode 8. You know, and then turns out he did survive, so he comes back up. So, yeah, you could, you could have some really cool stuff with that. Another option could be a massive army of troopers. Maybe one kind that seem especially dangerous. And maybe there are a lot in a place where X-Wings can shoot them. But there's also a lot in a place that can't. So there's stuff to do from multiple different, you know, multiple groups of different good guys fighting with different weapons and such. You know, I'm, I'm not saying, like, Stormtroopers. Because I realize that that's, you know, a lot of them aren't particularly, ah, what's the word, scary as a, you know, they, they are in episode four and, and episode seven, but yeah, maybe, would bounty hunters be interesting perhaps? Maybe like a, yeah, like, yeah, a couple of bounty hunters gang up on Kylo and Rey, so they're like outnumbered, and they gotta defend it against weapons that they can't. You know, oh, okay, so obviously you'd have to work to make sure it doesn't resemble the fight between Obi Wan and Django too much. But still, I th I think it could be. There's there's also a little bit of action in the Geonosis arena, where where Django's up there. But yeah, you know, some something along those lines. And, and definitely not a Sith that's related to one of the 
characters that we already know. I just, I, th I think we need to move past that, really. Un unless it, unless you really have something extremely compelling. Now, episode 8 clearly does not want to follow all of the stuff that the previous movie set up, and neither does episode 9. Both of them, it's kind of like watching the Joss Whedon Justice League after watching the Snyder Cut. There's stuff that's written that very clearly references and tries to adjust something that the writer-director was unhappy with from the other writer-director's vision. You know, a, a very distinct example being from, from the, the two cuts of Justice League, Aquaman saying, a strong man is strongest alone, ever heard that. And Bruce Wayne either just accepting that or saying, that's not the saying, that's that's the opposite of what the saying is. There's very clear tension there. I think it would have been much more interesting if the bad guy in this movie was not the Emperor. If the, you know, yeah, a couple of, a couple of options. One, the villain is a clone of Snoke or his father or son or something, and the heroes smash the cloning machine so there can never be another clone. And and like, yeah, make it make it that Snoke clones can't move very far away. They have to be in the same room as the cloning machine. That's why the original clone the the original Snoke didn't want to die because he didn't want to have to rely on these clones that can't leave the room. So the movie ends with the clone machine being smashed and for good measure they block every exit to the room so no Snoke can get out of there even if somehow one of them did manage to crawl out of the machine or something. You know, bl block every exit of the machine with, with something so thick and heavy that he can't telekinesis it off of there. And maybe something about, oh, this clone is stronger, at least, you know, certainly he shouldn't die as easily as he did in Episode 8. I get why a number of people were frustrated with that. I, I'm not sure I particularly mind. I, I love how subversive it was, personally. But yeah, you know, a clone or a relative. Yeah, you know, so that's uh, option one. Option, option two. Kylo really does try to be like Darth Vader. He wants to kill all of his opponents. He commits genocide. And then the movie ends either with Rey redeeming him, turning him, or that he gets the chance but refuses to. And so Rey is forced to kill him. And you can make that like the first time that she kills someone that she knows and understands like you know okay sure she's like killed stormtroopers or something but she's never killed someone where she could look in their eyes and she has to let's you know, make make it some kind of thing where like she doesn't have a choice but to look into his eyes as the life you know some some kind of really dark messed up thing like that and and maybe even end it with like She's not sure if she wants to be a Jedi anymore, even though she's the the best hope for a future Jedi, but she's not sure she can kill another person that, you know, and she maybe points out, you know, all, all of these other ones who did, you know, yeah, who did end up killing, having to kill someone. So in this movie, we are taught we, we're told almost nothing about how the Emperor actually managed to survive honestly part of me would seriously respect if there was like a flashback where we see him like you know we see him start to fall down the reactor shaft as we saw but he catches on to something on, on a wall pulls himself back up and jump in this teeny little jet and fly off, maybe even say, I'll get you next time. Yes, it's ridiculous. But is it that much more ridiculous than just, oh, he's, he's just back. 
Now, so yeah, the one of the reasons that the Emperor shows up in the movie is that one or more of the screenwriters felt it was necessary. It was something that had to happen because he was such an important part of the two trilogies. He had to be behind it all. And that's the thing. Like, I get that. But he, I, because he died and, and, like, it was for sure he died. Like, it should have been a disciple that, like... Yeah. Now, J.J. Abrams sometimes too focused on making that something that's cool rather than making it make sense. What was Ray gonna do when Kylo flies towards her if he actually started firing? Like, it looks cool that she jumps over it, but what if he fired a shot or like flew? Like, you know, she stands there and he flies and she jumps over and cuts. Imagine. If when she she jumps and he just go up and smashes into her, you know. I mean, it, basically they're playing chicken. If he, you know, started flying right before the yeah before she jumps, he'd fly directly into her, smash her hard, and just yeah. And there's no way that a lightsaber can deflect. Okay, so let's see. It's not called the TIE Fighter. It's like different. Is it the TIE Silencer? I know it's not called a TIE Fighter, but that's as far as... I, I don't remember what it's actually called. So in this movie, we find out that Leia has been training Rey because a lot of people said she was way too skilled for no training, even though Luke didn't get a lot of training and failed bunch of his training and of course some people criticize Leia for being able to train a Jedi but just because we didn't see her train doesn't mean she it didn't happen in 30 years that we barely saw him yeah I, th I think when I wrote that I didn't realize that we do actually see a little bit of the the training that Leia received from Luke now in the first movie it really seemed like Finn might end with Ray, a white woman, or Poe. Again, I... Okay, I'm gonna go with... I'm almost certain he's either Latino or Semitic. And then in episode 8, it seemed like Rose, an Asian woman. And in this, it's Jenna, a young black woman, to satisfy the homophobic crowd and the, the people who are terrified of like mixed race and marriage and such now so the um yeah one of my subscribers xvx asked me a little while back if i preferred the characters of the sequels to the prequels so now that i've watched the entire sequel trilogy you know, character-wise, they had good starting points for Poe, Finn, and Rey. But they didn't know what to do with Poe and Finn. And ultimately, like, it's not that Rey has not had hardship in her life. It's that a lot of what we see in the movies, she seems to handle very, very well. She doesn't... She's maybe not shown as struggling as much as some other Star Wars characters. And JJ and Ryan disagreed on what to do with Poe and Finn, so they went back and forth. Kylo was decently handled, but he was the exception of the rule. The prequel trilogy has problems, as I've talked about, but there are characters in them that do have fairly credible growth and are clearly defined. Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Padme, like, you can look at a scene, a line from them from the prequels, and you'd be more or less able to say which of the three movies they're from based on how far along in the arc they are. Now, so yeah, also about characters, you know, 
the actors of all three trilogies are incredibly talented. The yeah, in 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 some of the original trilogy and in the sequel trilogy, they tend to get more chances to show how talented they are than in the prequel trilogy. You know, the directors of these movies are better at getting natural acting performances than George Lucas. That was always something that he was not that great at. And I, I feel bad for him because, I mean, there's tons of people... Very few directors are great at all of the different things you have to be able to do in order to be a director. And there are other, like, there are definitely, I have to admit, it's been a while since I sat down and watched a lot of Kubrick, but from what I recall, cer certainly some of the performances, like his, the way he directed, I forget her last, Shelley... I'm afraid I forget her last name, but in, in The Shining, he didn't get a particularly good performance out of her. And she's a good actress. I've seen her in other stuff where she's significantly more convincing. But Kubrick is considered... Uh, Kubrick is one of the best directors of all time. I feel like George Lucas gets a bad rap. I think if other parts of the prequels were significantly better... People wouldn't notice the acting as much, but yeah, like if The Shining, if it, if the cinematography and editing and the pacing, like just, I've watched the hallway scene many, many times and it never stops being effective. It's just so brilliantly handled. It's, it's amazing. Now, J.J. Abrams voices the droid Dio, which at one point, in a sad moment, literally says the word sad, which is J.J.'s on-the-nose, overdone direction, taken up to a whole new level. He is 100% literally telling the audience to be sad. They fly now. They fly now. They fly now. Okay, the writer's stuck in a feedback loop. So, yeah, I already mentioned, I don't agree with everything that Closer Look said on, you know, the, the sequel trilogy in general. He made a video where he suggested that this trilogy should have been about, you know, good and evil forced to work together to fight a, off a third party. That's a really great idea, and I don't really have anything to add to that. I just want to make sure I, uh, you know, underline that's a really great idea. I, I think that's from Star Wars How to Kill Franchise. Again, make sure you also watch the video response by the focal point. But yeah, that would have been much more interesting than just, you know, at the end of the day, this is still just good versus evil. And that's that's worked for Star Wars in a, for a long time. But like, again, I'm not really a fan of the prequels, but at least it's not just good versus evil again, which, you know, the sequel trilogy is way too reminiscent of the original trilogy and does not do enough, does not add enough new stuff. When Rey uses the mind trick on the two stormtroopers at once, they suddenly become Rich and Larry from College Humor Troopers. The stormtrooper got hit by an arrow. Okay. Katniss Everdeen? No, that makes no sense. Hawkeye? Either, no. Wrong. Wrong Disney property. Oh, no. It's not Ewoks. It's fan service. I guess that's at least a little bit better than Ewoks. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, Lando Calrissian is better than Ewoks. But there's way too much fan service in this movie. In this movie, Rey is shown to be able to levitate not only herself, but also a series of boulders. Hypothetically, she could choose to arrange them in in a aesthetically pleasing way, which technically would make her a professional contemporary rock artist. 
I think there's some chance that the duel by the water is at least partially inspired by the duel by the lava in episode 3. So I really appreciate this is a much more believable location to duel. You know, like I said in my video about episode 3, it is completely impossible to believe that they could be that close to the lava and not get really badly burnt. But here it's a lot more credible and where the lava is partially there to show Anakin Skywalker's actions have as having led him to hell, this duel is revealing, cleansing in some ways, healing. These are all properties of water and, and you know, stuff that water can symbolize. So everything great about episode 9 video explains his perception of why Rey can fight back when Kylo tries to read her mind, which... Yeah, I think he did a really great job. Now, behind the scenes, they talk about... Let's see... Yeah, it was important for them that the audience felt as small as possible. Which, yeah, I, I guess I can sort of see that. Really love seeing Richard E. Grant in something. I've never... In, in something again. I've never been... Like... What's the word? I'm always happy to see Richard E. Grant. Even that, you know, flying vampire cow movie, I want to say it's called The Little Vampire. I, I'm not 100% sure, I can't put my finger on it, but for some reason, the, the quicksand really doesn't look real at all. Every time I look at it, it just looks so fake. It's it's the fakest looking thing to me in the, the sequel trilogy. I mean, you know, largely the sequel trilogy avoids fake looking stuff. Han Solo appears to Kylo Ren, who starts to say something, and then Han Solo, Han Solo says, I know, so Kylo's like, Oh, Dad, you're always interrupting me. You have no idea what I was going to say. Well, okay, son, what were you going to say? I don't even remember now. I'm so upset. I really thought when I killed you, you wouldn't be able to interrupt me anymore. Honestly, that was about 70% of the reason why I did it. So, Billy Lord, Carrie Fisher's daughter, is in some of the action scenes. And in behind-the-scenes footage, you can tell that she's really excited about it. And that's, that's yeah, so great to see. I forget, is that... I, f I feel like I either saw or heard something about that that's that Billy Lord is the one who plays young Leia in the Jedi training flashback that's really cool now for the yeah for the, for the last chunk of the time that Rey and Kylo spent together they're not doing that much that affects the other other than like Killing each other, bringing each other back to life. So, yeah. Rejoice, Raylo stands. That's that's definitely a, a couple. That's that's an old married couple, I'm pretty sure. And... Yeah, so when Kylo Ren finds the Emperor alive, the Emperor doesn't really explain how he's alive again, except... You can, you know, you can interpret his repeated line, the power of the dark side is bad way to many abilities, some considered to be unnatural, to mean that, you know, the power of the screenwriter is a pathway to some writing, which many consider to be terrible. Now, at one point in this movie, C-3PO's eyes are completely red. Now, when I saw this in, you know, before watching the movie, I thought, okay, so... Maybe that means he's evil, but I figure it's more likely that he is absolutely wasted. Like, that is that is definitely uh, the eyes of someone very, very high. Just just watch your, your snacks, is what I'm saying. They're gonna, he's going to devour them. So, by the climax, the Emperor has Kylo and Rey directly in front of him. 
So he uses Force Drain on both of them, and neither of them use Force Absorb to counter. So the Emperor has a cloning machine. We see many see-through, or many, we see some see-through cases with dead clones in them. Usually he doesn't like to show these things off. Normally you'll only see it if your twin dies and no one knows you even exist and then you shoot him, but he's making an exception. So some people say it doesn't make sense for Kylo and Rey to kiss each other when the movie ends since they had more of a brother-sister relationship with each other. But unfortunately, that is also very typical for Star Wars siblings. You know, it's very common for... Star Wars that siblings kiss each other and technically Palpatine is Anakin's father through midichlorians so technically they are related. I don't think there should be thousands of Death Star destroyers either may get uh, you know like maybe it takes a hundred to make a Death Star or make there be way less of the destroyers and actually yeah then you could have, instead of, like, here at the end, it's like, so they're attacking thousands of, like, just have it be that they are, like, grouped together, and if you destroy enough of them, they no longer are powerful enough to fire the, the Death Star. Like, you know, video game logic, I realize, but, yeah, you know, so, something like that. The, I, I want to say, maybe some of the Raptor... Call of the Shadows, enemies, boss enemies, if you do enough damage, they can no longer fire their most powerful weapons. So, you know, some something like that. And then it would also, it could add a sense of focus to the movie, because you could visually indicate how many of them need to be intact. And then when they, ah, what's the word? Yeah, how many of them to need to be intact for it to work? You know, you could show, like, of, uh, um, let's see, the, yeah, the beam itself is green. So, you know, if you had, like, okay, so you have, like, a triangle of the ship, and it's made up of, like, let's say, okay, maybe not a hundred, but maybe, like, nine. And so you need the part, you know, the, the one at the head, you need the one in the middle, some of the parts at the bottom. So you could have fighters coming in from all the different sides, shooting at the different ones. And then at first, it's able to fire back with Death Star. You know, like in Episode 6, the Death Star attacks ships. I th Yeah, I think that could really... How on earth did Zori make it out without the coin? I, I feel like... Yeah, I don't... I, don't... I think... Everything great about did cinema wins did try to explain that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe maybe there was a good explanation in there, and the and I just forgot. But yeah, so let's see the the ah, what was I thinking of? Ah, uh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit and watch it right now as I'm recording the video. If you really badly want to know if I agree with his answer, you know, post a comment down below asking me if I agree with it. I'll watch it and reply to you. So, I... Yeah, that is... That's it. That's all 11 live-action Star Wars movies, so it's not quite clear how long it's, like, at, I could imagine at some point they'll put something Star Wars in theaters again, but I, I've said it before, I think the, the best idea is more Disney Plus shows, you know, so far the only one I've watched is The Mandalorian, but, you know, I, I hear that Bo Book of Boba Fett isn't quite as good, but it, you know, I hear people say it's it's still pretty good. I could definitely imagine the Obi Wan series being interesting. You know, Ewan McGregor's Obi Wan was one of the best parts of the the prequels, and yeah, I could definitely see like the the stories, you know, stuff that happened 
between episodes three and four. You know, there's a twenty year period there that they they could cover. They just gotta be careful not to contradict the canon, but yeah. I don't really have an opinion on, you know, I hope the Ahsoka Tana show is good. I know she has a lot of fans. I'm probably not going to start watching it until I've watched Clone Wars, so it might be a while. But yeah, I, th I think that's very likely to be the most, the, the place where they can, you know, they, it's a place they can experiment. It's a place they can do stuff that they wouldn't dare do in movies. So, so yeah, but I want to know what you think. Which Disney Plus show of Star Wars are you most looking forward to? Which of the... I, I feel like, isn't there at least... I feel like there's more than Mandalorian, Book of Boba Fett. Visions, was that what it was called? I'm pretty sure that one's also Disney Plus exclusive. You know, if you want to let me know, you know, sure. Clone Wars, you know, throw that one in the mix. I feel like there's a couple of is one of them called Rebels maybe I I I really don't know much about them they look good they look good I've I've heard very good things about it and I do think serial like a, a show an ongoing show is a good way to delve more into Star Wars because it really does seem like with these movies they're a little too afraid to go into a completely new direction the you know the movies are, you know, gradually they, they, ah, I mean, okay, some of them do take big chances. I guess what I'm saying is I don't, I'm not that interested in episodes 10, 11, 12, unless you really, like, if they really show they're willing to go different places and take chances and do something interesting, but yeah. Yeah, let me know, do you think that, are you hoping for more Star Wars movies soon? Do you think it's the shows that's, you know, where it's at? What show are you looking most forward to? What show do you most enjoy watching? Uh, you know, yeah. And, yeah, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of The Mandalorian that I personally watched, and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time. May the force be with you, because it sure wasn't with this movie. You will like and subscribe.